Anthroposomatic Foundations Anthropological similarities between the Asian Aborigine and the American Aborigine manifested in the following common features, Mongolian spot in children at birth, skin pigmentation, slanted eyes, Mongolian fold, face shape and prominent cheekbones, poor body and facial hair, lysotric hair, shovel-shaped teeth. Ethnological Cultural Foundation Similar uses and customs, carrying children on one's back, eating on the floor, pentaphonic music, collective dances, etc. Aleutian Islands Theory Proposed by Knut Fladmark, it suggests that it was the sea route by which man arrived in America. The Aleutian Islands, a name derived from the name of the ethnic group that inhabited them, Aluti, is an archipelago of volcanic islands, a chain of more than 300 small volcanic islands that describe a wide arc of about 1,900 kilometers running southwest from Alaska, United States to the Kamchatka Peninsula, Russia. The islands are located between the Bering Sea to the north and the northern Pacific Ocean to the south. Almost the entire archipelago is part of the state of Alaska, although the westernmost islands are part of Russia. The islands are located north of the Pacific Ring of Fire and there are 57 volcanoes. Australian Theory it was supported by the anthropologist Antonio Mendez Correa, he states that America was populated by a migratory current coming from Australia, a group of Australian and Tasmanian fishermen would have gone to sea and accidentally been dragged by sea currents towards the south and would have reached the Auckland Islands, from where they followed the current and would have reached Antarctica, a continent that they would have managed to cross thanks to the occurrence of an optimum climaticum. That is, Antarctic warming which would have allowed these men of tropical climates can survive. After having crossed Antarctica they would have embarked again on their fragile boats and reached the southern tip of America, Tierra del Fuego and Patagonia where they would have given rise to some indigenous tribes such as Onas, Mapuches, Fueguinos, Alacalufs and Fueguinos. Some other evidence that supports this theory is Similarity in Blood Groups O Use of throwing weapons, the boomerang. Construction of beehive-shaped huts. Multiple origin theory of American man. Paul Rivest was a French ethnologist, creator of the oceanic or multiracial theory, according to which the indigenous American population is the result of migrations from Asia, Australia, Polynesia and Melanesia. The waves were separated by different periods of time, providing Asian, Australian and Melanesian Polynesian characters. Mongoloid. The first to enter America would be the Asians, through the Bering Strait. They would provide pre Mongolic and Mongolic elements themselves, evolving physically and culturally. Australians. Secondly, the Australian elements arrived, demonstrated, according to Rivet, by great physical similarities between the skulls of the Patagonians and the Australians the predominance of blood group O in both groups and the common use of cultural productions such as ceramics, cloaks made of animal skins, circular huts made of branches, the use of mosquito nets, wooden drums, hanging bridges, the use of hollowed-out trunks as canoes, similar religious ceremonies, etc. Melanesian Malay Polynesian Also raised by Paul Rivet It is just a variant of the previous hypothesis, here the researcher proposes a migratory current towards America coming from the islands of Melanesia in the Pacific Ocean, which was inhabited by black people who arrived in Central America. Polygenic Theory It is a theory about the origins of men, and it also postulates the existence of different lineages for human races. Samuel Morton stated that human beings evolved in parallel in America, Asia, Africa, and Europe. Samuel George Morton 1799-1851 He was an American doctor versed in natural sciences, widely recognized as a scientific racist and disseminator of the theory of polygenism. Morton claimed that he could determine the intellectual capacity of a race by the size of the skull. A large skull implied a large brain and outstanding intellectual abilities, while a small skull indicated low intellectual abilities. Morton collected hundreds of human skulls from all over the world. 
Studying them, he distinguished at what point an individual stopped being white and at what point the black race began. Morton, who had many skulls from ancient Egypt, came to the conclusion that the ancient Egyptians were not African but white. The Clovis Culture Ridgely Whiteman, 19 years old, discovered the first archaeological pieces. Since the mid-20th century it has been the generally accepted theory among archaeologists. Clovis were the first inhabitants of the American continent. The main basis for this theory was that no solid evidence of pre-Clovis human presence had been found. According to classical theory, the people of Clovis are those who crossed the Beringian Bridge over the Bering Strait from Siberia to Alaska. Clovis Lithic Industry They perfected tools made from stones, such as flint and obsidian, to be able to hunt. On their journey south they encountered large animals that had never had predators before. In order to hunt them they had to invent a whole hunting technology. Apart from the Clovis points, biface points were found, some with half-moon shapes among others. Topic 2. Lithic Period The Lithic Period Also called pre-agricultural, these human groups had a parasitic or predatory economy, they did not know the technique of agricultural production, their food sources came from hunting, gathering, and fishing. In this period, the production of the first stone elements for hunting large animals began. At this stage human groups were nomadic. The Stone Period, also called the Paleo-Indian Period, spans from 45,000 to 7,000 BC. In this period, the production of the first stone elements for hunting large animals began. At this stage, human groups were nomadic, they lived in caves or rock shelters, where they made engravings or rock paintings. On the walls of these caves the first inhabitants of the current Peruvian territory left their mark through drawings. The Fear of Natural Phenomena The archaeological evidence found allows us to specify that this man has beliefs and superstitions, he is an animist since he is worshipping natural phenomena, rain, earthquakes, lightning, thunder, etc., which he cannot explain and which he fears. When one of these phenomena occurs, man seeks protection in his rock shelters, caves or caverns, and stops to look for a solution or interpret what is happening. Fear leads him to offer sacrifices to appease the inclemencies of nature, generally it is offered to the youngest of the band, the last to be born. The sacrifice of children in the lithic period can be understood since in this period the older members are productive agents and it would be harmful to offer a hunter or gatherer as a sacrifice which is why man chooses to quench the thirst of nature with infants. Superior Paleolithic The Paleolithic period or ancient age of stone, we can affirm that it covers from the origins of life to the emergence of new agricultural techniques, during that time the use of tools such as carved stones, bones, leather, wood, etc. was implemented. It is even here where humans discover fire. The term was created by archaeologist John Lubbock in 1865, this period being the longest in history. The period is divided into three phases, Lower Paleolithic, Middle Paleolithic, Upper Paleolithic. Men and women were organized in groups united by ties of kinship, new forms of organization began starting from the family group, the division of labor began, whose first expression must have been the distribution of tasks according to sex. While the men pursued large-game prey or fought with rival groups, the women dedicated themselves to raising children, collecting plants and obtaining food that did not involve separating themselves too much from their children. In the lithic industry, the laminar technique was used, which consisted of producing elongated instruments, with parallel and cutting edges, very similar to today's knives. The technology whose raw material was bone was oriented towards the manufacture of throwing weapons, many of which show a decoration that can be considered artistic. Topic 3. Lithic Period in Peru Time of Initial Settlement of the Territory It was confirmed that the Lithic Period was also part of the American settlement that began approximately 20,000 years ago, during the end of the Pleistocene when the Andes were still covered by glaciers. The current Peruvian coast was more humid than today, 
Our jungle was more tropical and impenetrable with an abundance of flora and fauna. During this period, agriculture was not yet developed and tools were mainly designed in stone. The magnificent Andean man constantly struggled to adapt to the geographical environment of very abrupt relief and large mountains. The first Peruvian inhabitants were possessors of extensive skill in making utensils and new specialized hunting techniques. The Peruvian man was a hunter, gatherer and fisherman, initially practicing a parasitic economy. The first Homo sapiens from North America arrived in this region of South America, with quite limited cultural advances. These men lived in a state of nomadism due to their inability to produce food on their own, taking shelter in caves or rock shelters because they did not yet know how to build their homes. They developed a parasitic economy, they depended on what the geographical environment provided them. The Peruvian man was progressively establishing himself in our geographical environment, especially in the Puna or High Andean Plateau. The Puna is a region of low atmospheric pressure, less diffusion of oxygen in the air and a frigid climate, with little rainfall and an average annual temperature of 6 centigrade Celsius to minus 7 centigrade Celsius. All these geographical factors, combined with the relief, have given several endemisms to the region which has also been the cradle of various pre-Columbian cultures. It has historical importance for having been the place where various civilizations emerged, such as the Tiahuanaco culture, and the domestication of plants such as the potato and animals such as the llama was carried out. Due to its environmental and ecological characteristics, it is a unique natural region on the continent and due to its altitude it belongs to the so-called Puna region. The Primitive Settlers the men who arrived in South America had to overcome environments never before known. Indeed, they had to fight against the oppressive heat, the unexpected torrential rain, the high and cold plateaus, the tangled jungle and its vermin. However, once again, primitive man demonstrated his extraordinary capacity for adaptability and conquered the mountains, hills and valleys, geographical spaces to which he was already accustomed. The Peruvian territory, Central Andes, in particular, offered ecological diversity with abundant flora and fauna, which must have been very attractive to the first men. Julio Cesar Teo Rojas He was the son of a modest baking family, and grew up in the province of Huaracayri. It is said that from a young age he stood out for being intelligent. In 1900 he entered the Faculty of Medicine of the Universidad Nacional Mayor de San Marcos, where he was a classmate of a son of the illustrious traditionist Don Ricardo Palma. He had his teachers celebrities from the scientific world, such as Aleshred Liska and Franz Boas. He obtained his master's degree in arts in 1909 and in anthropology in 1911, being the first Peruvian to achieve such an academic degree. As a result of his studies, he obtained a new scholarship, which allowed him to attend the 18th International Congress of Americanists in London in 1911 and to continue specialization studies at the Anthropology Seminar of the University of Berlin in 1912. At that time he met the English Lady Olive Chessman, whom he later married. Julio Teo also served as Professor of American and Peruvian Archaeology and General Anthropology. He published, among other works that have made known important aspects of the Inca and pre-Inca cultures. Autochthonism of Peruvian Culture The great teacher Julio C. Teo always postulated the autonomous character of the Andean evolutionary process from an Amazonian Arawak's diffusion focus, whose oldest expression was the Chavan culture, matrix of the development of the cultures of the coast. Cultural autochthonism is understood when a culture originates from the same territory in which it has developed. Teo maintained that the oldest culture in Peru was the Chavan culture, which emerged 3,000 years ago in the eastern mountains of the Department of Ancash, and that from there it had radiated to the coast and other regions of the Andean area. He thus contradicted Max Uhl's immigration theory, which maintained that cultural elements arrived on the Peruvian coast from Mesoamerica, to then radiate to the mountains. Teo also maintained that the initiators of the Chavan culture were people from the Amazon jungle, 
bearers of a rudimentary culture, but who over time forged a high culture, without receiving any foreign influence. To support this thesis of Amazonian origin, he pointed out the apparent representation of Amazonian animals in Chavan art, mainly the caiman and the odorongo. According to Tello's theory, Peruvian culture would have the following process. 1. In prehistoric times, groups of primitive men from the north arrived in the Amazon jungle. These people lived by hunting, fishing, and gathering. 2. In search of a more welcoming environment, these groups ascended the eastern flank of the Andes and settled in the jungle or high jungle, an area that is very favorable for life. There they discovered agriculture and learned to grow corn, cassava, sweet potato, beans, peanuts and fruit trees, papaya, cherimoya, avocado, pineapple, sarsap, lucuma, pesi, granadilla. With agriculture, a sedentary life arose, the construction of houses, the manufacture of utensils, fabrics, baskets, etc. culture itself was born. 3. Continuing their ascension, these men arrived at the Interandean Mountains, where they perfected agriculture. They domesticated the potato, the canigua, the quinoa, the osea, the aluco and animals such as the llama and the alpaca. They greatly developed textiles, ceramics, stone architecture, etc. For, later the men from the high mountain cultures came down to the coast and formed the coastal cultures. A Lochtanism of Peruvian Culture It was proposed by Federico Kaufmandoig, he concludes in an explanation of the origin of Andean culture, stating that the remote origins of Peruvian high culture were located beyond our current border limits. For this anthropologist, the centers of high culture in Mexico, Bolivia and Peru did not arise spontaneously and independently, but rather came from a common group that later spread. He argues and defends that the diffusion of the Olmec culture is what gave rise to it. To the Chavan Civilization Kaufman's position was based on several premises, such as the following. The Chavan and Cupasni cultures, then considered the oldest in Peru, from 1500 to 1000 BC, did not have antecedents on Peruvian soil that would explain their formidable flowering. This arose suddenly, without the necessary transition phases being seen archaeologically. The evidence of Peruvian pre-ceramics seemed too crude and elementary to be considered as antecedents of a ceramic as elaborate as that of Chavan and Cupasnik. The theory of the jungle origin of the Chavan culture supported by Teo was very fragile. The representation of monkeys and felines in Chavan art did not seem to be consistent evidence. According to the chronological panorama of that time, the first phases of Olmec ceramics, Mesoamerican formative, were older than those of Chavan and Cupasnik, and de informative. That is, Mexican high culture was older than Peruvian. Corn is the nuclear food throughout America, but the oldest evidence of its domestication is found in Mexico. Immigrationism of Peruvian Culture It was proposed by Max Ewell who maintains that the origin of Peruvian men would be foreign, and the men who had arrived in Peru by sea would be the Mayans and Aztecs, who would spread and radiate their culture through the central Andes, reaching the Peruvian coasts, to give rise to the great cultures of Proto-Chimu and Proto-Nazca and from their spread to the Peruvian mountains. Basics the ease of navigation that the Pacific Ocean provides as a means of communication and as a food source. The similarity of Mayan and Aztec art with some Peruvian cultural manifestations, especially in architecture, Chavan, Chan Chan and Grand Pagetan. The cultivation of corn is believed to be of Central American origin, although there was also a primitive variety of corn in Peru. Main Characteristics of the Peruvian Lithic Period the Lithic period constitutes the first evolutionary period of Peruvian man, it is also known as the pre-agricultural or nomadic hunter period. During this time, man will basically dedicate himself to indiscriminate hunting and gathering, that is, he prefers to hunt pregnant females or offspring, extracting them directly from their burrows, the Lithic tools they handled make hunting a very risky activity, therefore, they go in search of disadvantaged animals even though this contributes to the extinction of different species. Thus, the first Peruvian presents a subsistence,
consumption, or simply parasitic economy. This man faced the great megafauna typical of the end of the Pleistocene, the Ice Age. Bands constitute the first form of human organization, they are composed of 30 or 40 individuals led by the best or most experienced hunter. The different hunter-gatherer groups of the lithic period shared general criteria among themselves regarding the manufacture of their stone artifacts. This has allowed, in the case of the Central Andes, to group them into four large groups of lithic traditions. Tradition of the Far North The hunter-gatherer groups are characterized by having simple stone artifacts, worked only by percussion, and only on one of their faces, unifacial artifact, with the absence of lithic points. The use of these artifacts was multiple, non-specialized tools, and is related to economies of hunting small animals, fishing, and gathering. It is present in Pura, Tums, Cajamarca, and southern Ecuador. Pajanense Tradition Pajan is the name given to an archaeological complex located on the northern coast of the National Territory. The name Pijan derives from a town located on the northern bank of the Chicama Torrent, in the district of Pijan, Department of La Libertad. The archaeological remains found belong to the Andean or Palo-American Lithic period. Hunter-gatherer groups are characterized by having elaborate pedunculated points, that is, with a peduncle or appendix in the lower part of the point, of various sizes, predominating those of large dimensions, Pijan point or Pajanense point, worked by carving percussion and pressure. Associated with this type of point, simpler stone artifacts such as scrapers, knives, perforators and grinding stones are usually found. The burial of the dead is practiced. Hunting small and medium-sized animals, fishing, and collecting. It is present from Lambayek to Ica, in coastal and Yunda areas. Loricochen's tradition, hunter-gatherer groups are characterized by mainly possessing foliaceous points, leaf-shaped, along with lithic artifacts such as scrapers, perforators, knives, scrapers, hammers and grinding stones. Hunting of cane lids and deer is practiced, and to a lesser extent small animals, along with the collection of plants. The practice of funerary burial is little known. It is present in the central and southern mountains of Peru. Viscachinense tradition, hunter-gatherer groups are characterized by having mainly triangular and foliaceous tips, a style very different from that of the Loricochense tradition. Hunting of cane lids and deer is practiced, and to a lesser extent small animals, along with the collection of plants. It is mainly found in the Peruvian-Bolivian highlands and the southern mountains of Peru. Guitar Player's Man the Guitarero Cave is located 45 kilometers from the city of Juarez and 2 kilometers from the Shuplui district, Yungay province, in the foothills of the Cordillera Negra, 150 meters above the level of the Santa River and 2,900 above sea level. It is a cave whose mouth faces east, where at dawn the sun rises. It was occupied between 10,000 and 9,000 BC. It is known that these caves were used as a temporary camp during the hunting season and also correspond to the beginnings of agriculture in Peru, becoming an important testimony of the first primitive groups that inhabited these areas in remote times. The main activities that took place around this cave were hunting and gathering. Remains of corn, chile, bean, squash, paular, aluco, lucuma, and osea crops have been found. As well as stone instruments, the first that Andean man produced by sculpting flakes, were a projectile point and a knife stand out, both bifacial, corresponding to the lithic period. In archaeological excavations, beans, polares and other evidence of domestication have been found and the presence of primitive corn has been confirmed. They were discovered and studied by the American archaeologist Thomas Lynch. Man from Pacaycasa Flea Cave Man or Piki Machi, located 19 kilometers north of the city of Ayacucha, located on the right bank of the Pangora River, in the district of Pacacasa, province of Huamanga. Studied by the North American archaeologist Richard McNeish, he found lithic artifacts, along with bone remains of already extinct animals, dating back to 20,000 BC, considering the oldest presence of human presence in Peru. 
They contain artifacts made from flakes with modified edges. The bifacial carving trend seems clear and the selection of silified rocks reflects the intention to search for and know how to select good raw material. Snitch Man Discovered in 1961 by archaeologist Edward Lanning, guided by data provided by Thomas Patterson. He explored the Shivateros and Cucaracha Hills, finding a large number of lithic instruments, similar to Jabo's finds in Venezuela. It is stated that the resident of Shivateros began to use stone, wood, mud, and everything he found in nature to survive. They dedicated themselves to hunting in the hills of Carabelo and Ancon where there were large numbers of foxes, deer, llamas and guanacos, from the sea and the river they extracted fish and shellfish, also hunting sea lions, they also obtained insects, seeds and edible plants. They were always forming groups because it was easier for them to hunt to obtain food and shelter. The lithic utensils were worked with the percussion technique and in their initial phases they mainly made unifacial scrapers, in the most recent ones, elongated bifacial spearheads were made in the shape of leaves. The inhabitants of the Shion River lived at the beginning of the Holocene period characterized by the retreat of the ice and the extinction of megafauna. Toke Shovel Man Tokpala is located in the district of Ilabea, in the province of Jorge Basadra, Department of Tacna. In the art gallery we find various cave paintings, with various hunting scenes, which represent hunters cornering and killing a group of guanacos. In order to make these paintings, several colors have been used, including red, yellow, black and white. These scenes would have been made for magical religious purposes, with the aim of promoting a good hunt. The Topala man is considered the oldest and most famous cave painter in Peru. The Devil's Cave where his paintings were found is considered the most important Paleolithic art gallery in Peru. It was initially explored by Mayamir Bojovic and carefully studied by archaeologists Emilio Gonzalez and Jorge Muel. Pigen Man It was found that the first complete human fossil remains of a man and a woman were the oldest complete bone remains in Peru, located in the valleys of Viru, Pacasmeo, in the Chicama River Basin, coast of La Libertad, in the place complete human remains of a 25-year-old woman and a child of approximately 12 years old were found. The settlers of Pigeon were fishermen, hunters and gatherers who lived in the early Holocene, about 12,000 years ago, when productive activities, agriculture and livestock, were not yet practiced in the Andes. Carol Culture they were builders of colossal pyramid-shaped buildings that distinguished the people of Carroll from the other towns of their time in the Andes. The pyramid in the Andes is a large building used by the Caracas rulers as the center of their activities, whether religious, political or economic. It was the symbol and center of power. There the ceremonies were carried out that would guarantee the established order on dates indicated by a ceremonial calendar that emulated the rhythm of nature. The Carol Pyramids are the oldest found to date in the Andes, they date back to 5,000 years ago, approximately 3,000 BC. Building structures of this type required a high degree of technology and social organization to face the problems of its construction and the high expenditure of materials and energy. Rigorous studies have shown that this civilization is contemporary with other primitive civilizations in the world, such as Egypt, India, Sumeria, China, but unlike them, who exchanged their achievements, it developed in complete isolation. In America, it is the oldest of the pre-Hispanic civilizations, surpassing the Olmec civilization by 1,500 years, another important civilizational focus located in Mesoamerica. In Peru it surpasses in antiquity the Chavan culture that was in 1200 BC, which for a long time had been considered the mother culture of Peru. Currently, according to all indications, it can be stated that the Andean civilization originates from the Carol civilization. Characteristics Although in places like Valdivia, in Ecuador, ceramics had been produced since 4000 BC, in Carol it was not used, this is where the name pre-ceramic comes from, although Dr. Ruth Shady, its discoverer, prefers to speak of ceramic, that is, without ceramic, since the ancient settlers of Carroll had a large quantity of mates or cucurbits that they used as containers. They did not need pottery. 
The extraction of marine products, fish and shellfish, was the main provider of protein. Fishing techniques were developed, consisting of the use of hooks, lines, boats and cotton fiber nets with floats made of mates and weights made with knotted stones. Carroll's men developed intensive agriculture in the Soup Valley. They used simple tools such as sticks and antlers to dig. They also built very simple irrigation canals that carried water from the river to the crop fields. The food plants they cultivated were mate or squash, akira, pacey, pajuro, peanuts, chile, guava, lucuma, potato, paular, sweet potato, beans, avocado and corn. And of special importance was the cultivation of cotton, whose fiber they used on a large scale. Each settlement would be represented by an authority or kiraka, in addition to the principles of their alas or family groups. Kotash Culture They built it near the Agueras River, a tributary of the Hualaga River, very close to where the city of Wanuko is today. The climate and geography are conducive to human life, as well as to the development of agriculture and livestock. Kotosh is an archaeological site located in the district, province and department of Wanuko, in Peru. It is made up of a series of overlapping buildings with six periods of continuous occupation dating from the late archaic to the early intermediate. Kotosh is made up of a series of buildings built of stone edged with mud, with quadrangular floor plans and on platforms filled with pebble soil, edged stones and mud. These enclosures are relatively small, between 4 and 6 meters long, although there are also more than 10 meters long. They all lack windows and probably had flat roofs. Inside each enclosure you can see a quadrangular floor that consists of two levels, a lower one in the form of a sunken floor, surrounded by another higher level as a bench. The lower level contains in the center a small pit that served as a fireplace, connected to a small underground ventilation duct. The internal walls, and sometimes those of the sunken floor, have niches of various sizes, and in some cases simple paintings or reliefs in the shape of crossed arms, as is the case of the Temple of the Crossed Hands. Paradise Culture El Paraiso is the modern name of a monumental archaeological complex from the late Archaic period, built between 3500 to 1800 BC, it is also known as Chukwatanta. It is located in the valley of the Xion River, on the central coast of Peru, several kilometers north of the center of Lima, capital of Peru and two kilometers from the Pacific Ocean. It belongs to the district of San Martín de Porres. Paradise was built with stones obtained from a nearby quarry, where several hammers have been found. There are walls up to 2.4 meters wide, with two sides of flat blocks. Like other constructions of the time, a characteristic was the use of large shikras, that is, nets or bags of plant fibers filled with stone, used as filling material. All the walls of the complex were plastered with mud and possibly received an application of paint, judging by the remains of ochre, white and red pigments. The building, with its many compartments, high doors and access steps, is set on platforms, which give it a pyramidal appearance. There are no remains of ceramics, but there are remains of cotton fabrics and plant fiber baskets, the so-called shikras. Five human burials were also found wrapped in cotton blankets. Wild plants such as the roots of sedges, tomatillos, and cattails may have represented a substantial part of the diet. More than 90% of proteins were obtained through marine resources, predominantly fish and mollusks. Haldos Culture it is located in the province of Kazma in the department of Ancash, at kilometer 345 of the North Pan American Highway, on the edge of the Pacific Ocean and 30 kilometers south of the Kazma Valley. It was discovered in 1958 by Frederick Engel and his collaborator Edward Lanning. Its main structure or pyramid, which stands on an elevation, has a rectangular, almost quadrangular base. This structure is accompanied by side pyramids or secondary temples, which have the same design as the main pyramid. On the upper platform of the main temple there is a structure with three walls, which forms a letter U open to the east and which contains the main elements of the cult. 
Las Haldas is one of the oldest and most important monumental centers of the formative period on the Peruvian coast. Its proximity to the sea and the imposing seascape that can be seen from the top of its main temple with its islets of La Gramida allow us to conjecture that its location could have been set in honor of the ocean, the Mamacocha or Mother of Waters, as they would call it. Later the catch was. Topic 4. Training Period and the Emergence of the Andean Society Throughout the first millennium before our era and is considered the first period in which different tribes and peoples shared similar religious beliefs, the cult of a jaguar god whose image is also associated with the snake and the eagle and creatures mixed with man and one of these animals. These beliefs were expressed in a common iconography and style. The cult must have been cruel and bloody, destined to be imposed by terror and thus demand the most blind obedience from the devotees, since the character represented in the Chavan Lance, found in the bowels of the old temple, summarized malignancy and must have frightened those who they were able to contemplate it, by the light of the torches, in the depths of the underground galleries in which it nested. The scientific and technological capacity demonstrated by the priests of the Jaguar God must also have had a powerful influence on the acceptance of the feline cult. It is evident that calendrical astronomical knowledge was of fundamental importance for an expanding society in which intensive agriculture began to be the basic pillar of the economy. Tutish Kanio Culture The vestiges of the oldest human occupation of Ukayali date back to more than 12,000 years, there is very little evidence of human presence in the upper Amazon. However, it is very likely that groups of hunters lived in the jungle near rivers. The research supported by Lathrap in the central Ucayali Basin on the shores of the Yaranacoca Lagoon, northeast of Pucalpa. They have evidenced the formation of the Tudishkanio, it presents a pottery quite elaborated with mastery in the art of pottery, bottle with a double neck and a central bridge, this shape of bottle is also found in the pottery of the lower Orinoco ravines, these indications reinforce the diffusion of ceramics from the Amazon. History of Peru Topic 1. People of America The American settlement constitutes one of the most relevant facts on our continent, its spread gives rise to numerous cultures, they had to adapt to the different climatic conditions, inhospitable places, dangerous for life, obtaining food allowed the fight for survival, and the technology development. Since his arrival on the American continent, man has always sought a climate similar to the one he reached through the Bering Strait settling in high areas above 2,000 meters high, from there he will begin to descend to the plains in looking for food to sustain their family group. Pleistocene, Ice-Free Corridor The Wisconsin glaciation was used by primitive man to move from the Asian continent to the American continent, through the Bering Strait, the climate became very cold, the glaciers advanced close to the tropics, in that area the continents were covered with ice, the shallow seas became glacial and many areas were united, giving rise to the Bering Bridge in America. The four main glacial periods are called Guns, Mindel, Riss, and Worm. Each of these glacial advances caused a drop in ocean level, even more than 100 meters, leading to the creation of land bridges between usually isolated areas. However, the desert areas were also drier and more extensive, due to the lack of rain caused by poor evaporation from the oceans. Iron Free Runner in the final moments of the last ice age, ice blocks began to melt at the edges of the two large ice sheets that covered the area now known as Canada, opening a corridor about 25 kilometers wide. This happened about 14,000 years before Christ. Given the opening of this corridor, the primitive humans who were in Beringia were able to advance into the interior of America and then head south. First American Settlers Paleoanthropological research adds to genetic information to reinforce conjectures about the origin of Americans. It is stated that most of the indigenous Americans are descendants of Northeast Asia and are the native speaking peoples and those who entered a second wave of migration would be the Inuit. They had copper skin, high cheekbones, dark eyes and straight black hair, that is, they had mongoloid or Asian features. They were nomadic groups, which were organized between 40 and 50 people. 
They enjoyed excellent health, since many of the viruses and bacteria they brought from Asia did not survive the cold to which they were exposed. They were skilled predators, manufacturers of throwing weapons that allowed them to hunt species of the megafauna of the late Pleistocene. Asian Immigration Theory It is an explanation for the late settlement of the American continent, proposed by the Czech-American anthropologist Alex Herdliska. This theory currently enjoys greater credibility within the scientific community. In 1929, Ridgely Whiteman, a 19-year-old indigenous man, wrote a letter to the Smithsonian Institute about a series of bones he had found in the village of Clovis, New Mexico. In 1932, in an excavation carried out by Edgar Billings Howard's team from the University of Pennsylvania, he confirmed that it was an indigenous human settlement during the Pleistocene, known as the Clovis culture, helping the livelihood proposed by Herdliska. The Tudish Canio ceramics are decorated with numerous geometric designs, extremely rare figures, with a head engraved with a cat figure, which would be the oldest feline representation in the New World, prior to the famous jaguars of the Andean area of Chavan. This data reinforces the argument that jungle cultures developed before Andean cultures. The hypothesis arises that men from Colombia would have arrived in this part of Ucayali, with relatively coarse ceramics from the polychrome tradition of the central jungle. They would have come up the rivers in canoes looking for land to colonize, this culture would not last long. Coming from the south, the Pano-speaking people arrived to take over the lands of Ucayali, they introduced the Pacacocha ceramics that were characterized by their simplicity, they are thick and poorly polished and have zoomorphic decorations, a technique imported from the central area of Bolivia the place from where the people had emigrated some centuries before. The Pano inhabitants of Ucayali lived in Malocas, they buried their dead in large urns inside the houses where they lived, they knew the weaving and preparation of bitter cassava. Lathrap maintained that early Tudishkanio gave rise to Werajurka, the initial phase of the Kotosh ceramic development sequence, in the Wanuko mountain range, around 1800 BC, just as it would have influenced the ceramics found in the Las Lechuzas cave, near Tingo Maria, from 1600 BC. Undoubtedly influenced by Julio Cesar Teo, Lathrap postulated the Amazon plain as a radiating focus of culture in America. Although it has been said that the appearance of ceramics in Peru was not the most significant aspect of the beginning of the Andean formative period, there is no doubt that it must have contributed to a substantial improvement in the living standards of the inhabitants of that time, since thanks to it the food preparation was significantly improved, because it was possible to cook food by placing the vessels directly on the fire. Kunturwasi Culture We can affirm that Kunturwasi was an important religious and cultural center, with a very complex architecture, composed of several stepped platforms, triangular rooms, a tomb plaza and a quadrangular sunken plaza on whose last step monoliths of anthropomorphic figures were found. The Contour Wasi religious complex is located in the northern mountains of Peru, in the Jequitapique River Basin, in Cajamarca, on La Copa Hill in the small province of San Pablo located over 2,300 above sea level. The temple was built on Cerro La Copa, in honor of the gods of the ancient world. The stepped platforms and funerary structures stand out, there is evidence of lithosculptures. In the tombs excavated in Contour Wasi, the funerary trousseau includes necklaces, crowns, ear cuffs, beads and gold pectorals embossed in openwork with designs of trophy heads and characters from Chavan iconography. One of the most important objects is the so-called crown of the 14 faces. It is a sheet of gold, with 14 small cut-out hexagonal windows, from which figures of human faces hang. On a stone plate, for example, a monster character with the face of a jaguar and a body similar to a spider appears carrying a bag with some heads inside on his back. In one of his hands, he holds the victim's head by the hair. This drawing would represent the scene of the decapitation and the spider monster in charge of transporting the heads of those sacrificed. In light of these references, it would not be strange if the 14 faces on the Contour Wasi crown represented the heads of the victims inside a basket. The gold pieces, dating back to 800 BC, are the oldest that have been found, not only in the Andes, 
but in the entire American continent. Second Culture The Temple of Cerro II, located in Ancash, is one of the most important archaeological monuments in Peru, given its antiquity, architectural beauty and cultural content. It boasts, like few others, a facade built with stone slabs engraved with suggestive motifs of warriors in procession, whose meaning is not yet fully defined, discovered for archaeology by the wise Julio César Tello in 1937. It is considered to have been the capital of an entire culture, which was called the Second Culture. It is from the end of the late archaic and the beginning of the lower formative. A distinctive feature of this monument is its veneered facade with monoliths with flat faces, on which figures are engraved in relief, which together seem to stage human sacrifices. The characters represented on the monoliths on the facades are of two kinds, the warrior priests, decked with a weapon or scepter, and the dismembered victims or their remains, mainly heads, limbs, skewered eyes, intestines, vertebrae and viscera, creating a gloomy scene. In the building you can distinguish the representation of two mythological fish, made with lines carved on the still wet mud wall. Another figure, representing a bleeding man, is secondary. These motifs relate the sea, rains and human sacrifice very closely. Cupisnik Culture It is stated that the Cupisnik culture developed on the northern coasts of Peru in what is currently the Department of La Libertad. 600 kilometers from the city of Lima. It was an agricultural society under the direction of an elite specialized in government tasks, that is, it was a theocratic society. They worshipped a deity with a human body and feline head and buried their dead in tombs along with an abundance of luxury trousseau that included ceramic vessels and jewelry. They believed in life after death, burying their loved ones and surrounding them with artifacts for use in the afterlife. They painted them red, to give them vitality for eternal life. The economy is based on agriculture based on corn, beans, cassava and pumpkins. Due to being in a coastal area, the Cupasneaks also developed fishing. Shellfish were the most abundant marine products and, therefore, the most appreciated. Chavan Culture Chavan is located in the Conchucho Zone, on the eastern side of the Cordillera Blanca, at the confluence of the Masna and Huachexa rivers, tributaries of the Marañón River, in the current district of Chavan de Huantar, province of Huari Ancash. The Chavan culture spread throughout a large part of the Andean region, covering the north to Lambayek and Cajamarca and the south to Ica and Ayacucha, which is why it is considered a pan-Andean culture. The Chavan culture was a class society, priests and warriors accumulating resources, while people were exploited to produce more. These leaders forced the community to produce more and ended up imposing themselves on others through knowledge of nature priests. The leaders of the Chavan culture have managed to build large buildings in honor of the gods. The main reason for the progress of Chavan de Huantar was modern, productive and innovative agriculture. The priests, they were the specialists who dominated the science of astronomy which gave them great influence and power, agricultural technicians were also brilliant hydraulic engineers. Warrior nobility, he was in charge of containing the onslaught of invasions and riots in the regions of the Chavan culture. He had an army capable of guaranteeing the necessary conditions for its development. The people, it was the popular masses who paid tribute to the gods and rulers. The Chavan culture was polytheistic. The main deity is a large animal like snakes with long hair and fangs, this was considered to balance opposing energies. There were several other deities that were worshipped by the people of the Chavan culture, including a deity represented by an alligator, and an underworld deity illustrated as an anaconda. Corn was their main source of food, as well as pumpkin, beans, cotton, potatoes, quinoa and peanuts. Their livestock is based on raising aquanids such as llamas, alpacas, and guinea pigs. The low relief sculptures on slabs, lintels, and columns are characterized by essentially zoomorphic repertoires, jaguars, snakes, condors, alligators, to which human faces are added. The clava heads, a type of round corbel engraved in the stones of the wall, 
one of which continues to exist in situ on the castle wall on the south flank of the temple, are one of the most exciting creations of monumental art of the Chavan culture. Machika or Mosh culture. The Mosh nation was a theocratic militarist state, there was no central government, but it was a group of independent lordships governed by a Kiraka, each of them controlled one or more valleys on the coast. The warriors must have enjoyed a special status, professional armies were formed for control, political domination and territorial security, as demonstrated by military complexes strategically located in the valleys and extensive walls that delimited the small kingdoms. The main center or capital of the Machikas was the Mosh Valley. Machika society was stratified. The Machika state expanded its territories through wars of conquest, the new territories were linked through a network of highways and roads. The Sequich, represented as a jaguar he was the ruler or king of one or many coastal valleys. The Aliak, they were kings subordinated to the power of a Mosh sovereign Sequich. The priest, represented as a fox they had great power in the Machika population and initiated religious rituals. The people, represented as a lizard, they were made up of farmers, fishermen, merchants, and artisans. Textiles and clothing were made mainly from vicuña and alpaca wool. They used guano to plant corn, beans, potatoes, pumpkins, peanuts, fruit trees, etc. They practiced fishing in Cabalitos de Tadora, they built large irrigation projects, hydraulic engineering works were carried out, such as the La Cumber Canal and the Escope Aqueduct. The Machicas had great experience as fishermen using reed horses. They fished for bulls, rays, sauls, etc., and collected shellfish such as sea urchins and crabs. For the ruling elite, tombs decorated with ceramic and metal objects, mainly gold and copper, like that of the Lord of Saipan. Their main god was Ai Apiak, a supernatural being who was represented by a human figure with the mouth of a tiger with fangs. One of the most important aspects of the religion of the Machika culture was human sacrifice. It was a complex ritual in which prisoners of war were offered by a priestess of the owl god. Rekue Culture Rekue is an archaeological culture from ancient Peru that developed in the Sierra of the current Peruvian department of Ancash between 200 and 600. The Rekue maintained contact with other cultures such as the Moshe, Cajamarca, and Tiahuanaco. One of the artistic manifestations was ceremonial ceramics. Their pieces were generally vessels made of kaolin, a very fine cream-colored clay. The Recue are recognized for their sculptural works made of stone, known as lithosculpture. These sculptures consist of carved stone slabs, in the shape of a prism or statuary, which were carved in high or low relief or by incision in the stone. They represented warriors, felines and snakes, human heads, faces and trophy heads, models and cups with pedestals, etc. On the other hand, the famous Recue monoliths stand out, stone blocks of almost cylindrical shape, apparently sculpted to represent high-ranking warriors. The economy was based mainly on agricultural practice, the area they occupied has abundant flora and fauna and also on the livestock of canelids, deer and viscachas from which they extracted meat or jerky and leather. About 15,200 BC, this species appeared. They had an economy focused on canelid farming. The mobility that their pack animals allowed them allowed them to access different ecosystems, which gave them access to resources that came from different environments. Nazca Culture Nazca culture developed in the current department of Ica. It was discovered by Max Uvel in 1901. The Nazcas had to face a natural desert environment, in which rains were very scarce. For this reason, they devised an efficient oasis management system and built a network of underground canals and aqueducts to distribute water from the rivers and take advantage of subsoil water. The channels were more than 10 meters deep. Every certain section the Nazcas made openings in the surface, the so-called waterholes and large reservoirs or pools to store water. Next to the underground aqueducts, the enigmatic geometric figures also attract attention. 
They were discovered by the archaeologist Toribio Mejia Zesp in 1927. They have been studied since 1941 by the North American Paul Kosak and especially by the German Maria Reich. These works, which have been going on for almost half a century, try to unravel the meaning of the Nazca lines. To draw these lines, the ancient inhabitants of the Nazca culture used various instruments, the tupu which was a metal or wooden plate placed perpendicular to the earth to project the shadow of the sun and the moon, the theodolite which was a wooden or terracotta tube from which a plumb line was hung to trace the course of the lines, and the string and the water level. Thus they represented figures of animals, human beings, plants, and geometric motifs. His works were characterized by their polychrome, decoration and form. The surface of his pottery was painted with all colors except green and blue. The pigments used were minerals extracted from the arid deserts of the region. Even the dyes were exported to other regions, such as Titicaca. The shapes of the most abundant pieces are pumpkin-shaped or lenticular. They have two divergent spikes that are joined by a bridge handle. There are also others in the form of bottles, tubular glasses and pots with handles on the top. Paracas Culture It was developed in the Paracas Peninsula, located in the Paracas district of the province of Pisco, in the Ica region, located 18 kilometers from the city of Pisco. Its main centers were in the Bay of Paracas and its influence reached Chincha, Pisco, Ica, Palpa and Rio Grande. The Paracas culture spread in the north to the Canet Valley and in the south to the Laca Valley in Arequipa. As important remains of this culture, in the Ica Valley there are two villages, Peña Bajuana and Animas Altas, and in the valley of Chincha the Pink Waka. The Paracas culture was an important society in the history of Peru, well known for its textile art, its mummies and for cranial trepanation to cure fractures and tumors in the skull. The Paracas culture was discovered in July 1925 by the Peruvian archaeologist Julio Cesar Teo, in front of Paracas Bay and south of Pisco. Teo studied how the Paracas buried their dead and maintained that this culture went through two eras. The Paracas inhabited a territory with a warm and dry climate in summer. They survived thanks to fishing, hunting and collecting fruits and shellfish and crops from their valleys. To reclaim land from the desert, they used two main techniques. The holes or sunken fields, which consisted of digging a hole until reaching moist soil to cultivate. Irrigation canals, which consisted of cutting the rock from the slopes of the hills and raising the walls to channel the water. Society The Paracas were governed by a powerful elite that apparently exercised a theocratic government based on religious power. This elite controlled the population through the fear of the gods. The social hierarchies were very clear. Some dead were wrapped in beautifully decorated cloaks, some in more ordinary cloaks, while others were almost naked. The Funeral Rituals The deceased were placed in bundles in the fetal position, because they thought that to be reborn they had to be in the same position they maintained in the womb. Cranial Trepanations these surgical operations consisted of drilling a hole in the skull to remove a piece of damaged bone. They used special knives made of hard, glassy stone called obsidian, they used coca leaves and chicha de jora to anesthetize the patients. The Art of Paracas Architecture They built ceremonial centers, enormous pyramidal temples, surrounded by plazas, they also built villages that were located on the slopes of the mountains. The houses had stone foundations and the walls were made of quincha. Ceramics It was polychrome and had post-firing paint, the colors were applied after the ceramic came out of the kiln. Textiles They wove beautiful and colorful cloaks with vicuña fiber, cotton, tertiary hair, women's hair, and bat hair. Cajamarca Culture it is stated that the archaeologist Julio Cesar Teo was the one who discovered it, finding more than 90 archaeological sites, among those that currently stand out, the archaeological complexes of Cumbameo and Lazen. It extended from the Department of Amazonas, to the mountains of La Libertad and the north of Ancash, 
Its center of greatest influence and development was the Interandean Valley of Cajamarca. The Priinca center of Cajamarca occurred in the area occupied today by the provinces of Cuturvo, Chota, Santa Cruz, Walgayoc, San Miguel, Celandin, Cantameza, San Pablo among others. Cajamarca ceramics are made based on white clay called kaolin, which serves as a background for the decorations. To paint the vessels they used fine brushes with which they drew geometric lines and figures, stylized zoomorphic motifs. The decorative tones range from very light colors such as red and orange to very dark ones such as brown. The design motifs include geometric elements such as triangles, circles, lines and points, animals such as birds, felines, camelids, and snakes. Sometimes there is a design on the base of the bulls. The Cajamarca people used to bury their deceased in niches dug into the rock, generally known as ventanillas. The best known are around Otusco, 8 kilometers north of the city of Cajamarca, there, the cavities dug in the rock reach hundreds and each one of them reaches 8 to 10 meters deep. The Cajamarca had a set of deities related to the sun, the moon, and the stars. The most important was Atagujo, the creator of the world, followed by Catequil, who produced rain, lightning, thunder, and lightning. They represented him as a man with a club in one hand and a sling in the other, who when pulled with the sling produced lightning bolts. Lima Culture The German archaeologist Max Uhl was the one who discovered the Lima culture. Their architecture stands out for the use of small adobe bricks, as well as rammed earth, based on which they built high pyramids, to expand the agricultural land, they carried out monumental works of hydraulic engineering in the Rimac Valley. They designed truncated and stepped pyramids, they used adobe. There was a prominent social sector made up of priests and merchants, which gave the state a deeply religious and merchant content. There are no militaristic signs in this society. It is confirmed that there was a large social sector where farmers, fishermen and artisans were present. Some tombs contain extended corpses, tied in a type of cane or stick stretcher, covered with cotton or wool mantles and fine grave goods, placed from north to south. There are many burials in pairs, next to them were several corpses with their throats cut, mutilated and dismembered. Others are intact, which suggests that priests and courtiers sacrificed their slaves so that they would accompany them and serve them in the afterlife. Lima monumental architecture has two recurring techniques. The use of rammed earth, that is, walls made from large adobes or rammed clay adobes. The use of small adobe bricks. Very often these adubites are arranged inside the wall vertically, like books on a shelf. This technique did not survive after the end of the Lima culture. Lima iconography was inspired by geometric and marine designs, including waves, fish, and two-headed snakes. The divinities represented were linked to the sea. One of the most important was a hybrid being that had features of a fish, alligator, and feline, a deity that appears in a vessel found in the Waka Paklana. Wari Culture it is confirmed that the Wari or Wari culture was a pre-Columbian Andean civilization covering the current departments of Lambayeque, Macagua, and the jungle of Cusco. It is confirmed in some of its ceramics the representation of divinities with anthropomorphic and zoomorphic features, similar to the god of the staffs of the Tiwanaku. In Ayacucha, the Warpa culture existed, which developed important economic contacts with Nazca allowing a notable development of artisanal and cultural production to take place in Ayacucha. The Warpas left their villages to gather in the city of Wari and others nearby. These settlers had a long military tradition due to the constant fights for resources in the mountains. These are the conditions that allow the transition from Warpa to Wari, between the years 560 to 600. In the city of Wari you can see monumental buildings such as public buildings of various types, mausoleums, and a kind of underground chambers. They must have been used to preserve the corpses of important dignitaries of the city. At the foot of the walls that delimit the buildings there is a large network of canals for the water supply. The city is built with rustic stones, with very high walls made of stone and mud, 
with terraces and platforms also made with that material. The Wares fought and conquered nearby towns using an army whose main weapons were stone axes, metal clubs, bows, and arrows. The Wares introduced a new conception of urban life, implementing the model of a large walled urban center. The best known Wari cities are Picalacta in Cusco and Wiracochapampa in Huamachuco, which in turn are the extreme territories of the empire. The city of Wari mainly based its economy on the exploitation of the colonies that it conquered through war. Both the taxes from the colonies and other factors of domination allowed the maintenance of this great city. The Wari's interest in the jungle is linked to the consumption and production of the coca leaf. There is evidence of the entry of the Wari culture through the Aparimac River Basin. In addition to the coca leaf, it is also believed that the Wari's may have been interested in cotton crops, feathers and exotic birds, monkeys, hallucinogenic plants and taper legs, this is deduced because these elements were associated with art and culture in the city of Wari. Tiawanako Culture The Tiawanako culture, of URU Pukina origin, developed on the shores of Lake Titicaca. It is confirmed that it covered part of the current territories of Bolivia and Peru, but it mainly developed in the Bolivian highlands. The first European to describe the archaeological remains of Tiawanako was the Spanish chronicler Pedro Cieza de Leon in the 16th century. The city of Tiawanako was founded approximately in 1580 BC, as a small village, and grew to urban proportions between 300 and 500, achieving an important regional power in the central Andes. The policy developed by the Tawanakota culture was theocratic, meaning that it did not use military force in its territorial conquests. Towards the years 400 and 500, the Tawanakotas reinforced their religious power by concentrating worship in the city, expanding their territorial domain towards the coast in the west and the tropical forest in the east. The Tiawanako economy was based on agricultural, livestock and craft activities. They had agricultural enclaves in the Maritime and River Yungas, in addition to the Interandean Valleys and the Puna. The accumulation of wealth occurred through heads of cattle. The various Tiawanako elites managed large herds of camelids that were used to make high-quality textiles. Its polychrome tapestries were a demonstration of prestige and power of the elites. By managing large herds, he also managed the commercial transportation of coca leaves and corn that traveled from warm areas to the ceremonial center of Tiawanako. He is called God Wairakocha or the Staff and was the main god of the Tiawanakotas, and according to some hypotheses, this deity could be the same Tanupa of the later Imira kingdoms, or the Wairakocha of the late Incas. Historically, the deity of the staffs has been worshipped on the Kalao Plateau since times before the Tiawanako and appears late in the Wari. Materials such as offerings, pottery, copper fragments, camelid bones and human burials have been found. Dismembered men and children were found with their skulls missing, these human remains were accompanied by disarticulated camelids as well as ceramics. Topic 5. Period of Regional States Consisted of powerful entities, not so much because of the number of inhabitants, but because of the provision of large deposits or warehouses that guaranteed the food of the inhabitants, and allowed them to develop activities other than agricultural and livestock production, that is, they allowed the development of specialists who would separate themselves from agricultural activities, to dedicate themselves to more scientific activities such as the observation and movement of celestial bodies. The study of weather and climate, being able to provide forecasts, which, if fulfilled, gave them prestige and respect. Construction specialists, textile artisans, potters, metallurgists, etc. would also appear. Lambayak Culture the Saikan culture was based on a theocratic state, whose political and religious center was initially based in the Baton Grande complex. Towards the end of the year 900 AD, the center of power moved to Tukum. It is confirmed that the inhabitants of the Lambayek culture developed a hierarchical social structure, where power resided in an elite that was based on its divine origins and kinship ties. The other social groups were in charge of administration, 
crafts, and agriculture. The Lambayek culture developed between the valleys of Motup in the north and Jekadapik in the south, between 700 and 1350. Although its cultural center encompassed the current department of Lambayek, its influence extended throughout the area from Solana to the north. Department of Pura, to near Trujillo to the south, Department of La Libertad. Lambayek was born from the ashes of the Moshe culture, when it declined, possibly, due to a devastating El Niño weather phenomenon. Lambayek added to its Moshe heritage the cultural treasures of Wari and Tiwanaku. Due to its geographical location, it also received cultural influence from the Cajamarca culture. A fourth influence came from the Chimu. Although Lambayek was a little older, both descended from the Moshe, only that Lambayek arose in the north, while Chimu, in the south. According to the legend written by the Spanish chronicler, Miguel Cabello Balboa, a great king by name, he arrived by sea from the south, amidst a large fleet of rafts and accompanied by a luxurious court of officials, versed in different arts and crafts. He landed at the mouth of the Fakwaslanga River, Lambayek River, and went about two kilometers inland, settling in a place where he built a waka that he called Chot, which is probably what is currently known as Waka Chotuna. The king brought an idol of green stone, emerald or jade, called Yampelek, from which the name Lambayek derives, which was a representation of his own image, the same one that he kept in the waka of Chot. Nalamp inaugurated a long period of peace and prosperity in the region. The nobility buried him in his palace, but eager to make people believe in his immortality, they announced that, tired of earthly life, he had used his power to grow wings and had taken flight to heaven. Thus, he was converted into divinity. Nalap inaugurated a dynasty of several sovereigns, twelve in total, including himself, the last of them, King Fempalek, wanted to move the Yampalek idol to another place, provoking the wrath of the gods. In that trance, a demon in the form of a woman appeared to Fempalek and tempted him to have carnal relations. The king's sin caused a series of misfortunes for the Lambayek nation, rains, droughts, famine. The punishment was completed when a powerful tyrant, Chimo Kapak or Chimu Kapak, later arrived from the southern kingdoms, who took over the rich lands of Lambayek. The Lambayek had a rigid social stratification. At the top was the king and his family. Then the administrators, who were in charge of monitoring the economic order. The artisans and specialists followed, who produced luxury goods for the elite and also for export. Lastly, there were the farmers and common people, who worked to support all the previous classes. The Lambayek built large monumental complexes with several pyramids made of adobe bricks, all truncated, that is, without vertex or tip, just like that of the Moshe. The main pyramids or huacas are found in Baton Grande, Tukum and Aperlec. The use of metals came from the Moshe tradition, which in Lambayek was perfected with greater technical mastery and new styles. They covered the entire metallurgical process, from the extraction of metal from the mines to the preparation of alloys, and in the latter, precisely, they surpassed their Moshe predecessors. In goldsmithing, most jewelry is splendid, but to the eye of an expert, those from Lambayek are more perfect in terms of finish. These advanced techniques are casting, laminating, lost wax, soldering, embossing, ironing, alloying and gilding. With the decorative addition of precious stones, emeralds, turquoise, pink quartz and pearls. The Tumi Lambayek stands out especially, a ceremonial knife considered the king of pre-Columbian metallurgy which consists of two parts, the handle, which probably represents the god Nalamp, and the blade, which is shaped like a crescent. Another notable example is the gold funerary mask, also with features of Nalamp or another divinity with marine attributes. Chimu Culture The Chimu culture was one of the pre-Inca Peruvian cultures that developed in the city of Chan Chan, especially in the Moche Valley, currently located in the city of Trujillo. The culture emerged around the year 900, in the hands of the great Chimu Takanamo. The Chimu culture was discovered by archaeologist Max Ahul. The Chimu culture succeeded the Machica culture around 700 BC. 
Its main administrative center was the great city of Chanchan, made up of thousands of buildings and a labyrinth of streets and alleys. Chanchan, which was perhaps home to some 60,000 people at its peak, was one of the largest cities in South America and the largest adobe city in the world. The rulers were treated as gods and lived in an elegant Chan Chan palace. From a political point of view, the Chimu kingdom can be defined as an aristocratic classist state. It had a bureaucracy of administrators. The state became strongly centralized and oriented towards imperial expansion. It was a classist society, with profound differences between its social groups. At the head of the social pyramid was the great lord called Si Quich. Then came the Aliak or Great Caracas. Next there was a group with a certain prestige and economic power called Fixla. At the end was the town, dedicated to fishing, agriculture, artisanal tasks and commerce, and as the last group, the servants or slaves. The economic and social system functioned through a network of urban and rural centers that were responsible for receiving and sending the taxes obtained to the capital. The chimneys grew corn, beans, pumpkin, pumpkin, peanuts, lucuma, avocado, friar's plum, pacey, saigua, sarsop, and cotton. For fishing they used reed horses, with these they entered the sea to catch a wide variety of fish, for which they used nets held between two boats or hooks. They also collected marine mollusks such as mussels, clams and snails. Marine products made up the majority of their diet of animal origin. They complemented their diet with domestic animals such as llamas, ducks, guinea pigs and dogs, even with seabirds that they knew how to keep in pens. The designs are of zoomorphic figures such as fish and birds, as well as geometric figures, all polychrome. Chimo ceramics fulfilled two functions, as containers for daily or domestic use and ceramics for ceremonial use or for burial offerings. The main characteristics of the Chimo vessels are a small sculpture at the junction of the neck with the arch, their manufacturing molded for ceremonial ceramics and modeled for daily use, their coloration generally metallic black with some variants, their characteristic shine was obtained by smoking the vessel, which had previously been polished. Many realistic representations such as animals, fruits and characters, as well as mystical scenes, have been captured in ceramics. They dedicated a special cult to the moon because they considered it to be more powerful than the sun since it illuminated at night, due to its influence on the growth of plants and its use as a marker of time. The uproar of the sea and storms were attributed to him. She was the visitor from the other world and punisher of thieves. Its main temple was called Sian, which means, House of the Moon, where rituals were performed on the first night of the new moon. Moonshur, Sian-I, Sun Jiang, Earth Guys. The Chima sacrificed infants to their gods. They offered the sacrifice of children under five years old to the moon. Their bodies were wrapped in colorful cotton blankets, buried on the esplanades of the temples, accompanied with fruits and chicha was poured on the ground. Chan K Culture This culture developed on the central coast of Peru, with its center in the Chan K and Xion valleys, but extended its influence to Huara, in the north, and the right bank of the Rimac River in the south, during the late intermediate period, from 900 to 1400 BC. It is a desert territory, although with fertile valleys that make up true river oases, rich in resources. It based its economy on agriculture, fishing and commerce. To develop agriculture, its engineers built water reservoirs and irrigation canals. Geographically located in front of the sea, they exploited artisanal fishing both from the shore and moving a little further away from it with the Cabalitos de Tadora. They were also notorious traders with other regions either by land towards the Peruvian mountains and jungle and by sea towards the north and south of their territorial limits. The Chanque culture is the first of those Peruvians that massifies its production in ceramics, textiles as well as metals such as gold and silver from which they made ritual and domestic goods. They were also noted for their carved wooden items. The Caracas regulated the productions of artisans, ranchers and farmers as well as festive activities. 
Their textiles with needle-embroidered lace and tapestries were of singular notoriety, they were made with cotton, wool, chiffon and feathers. Brocade, the technology of decorated chiffon and painted textiles stood out, having been decorated with fish, birds and also with geometric drawings. With a brush they produced canvases painted directly with anthropomorphic, zoomorphic, geometric designs and other creative drawings of free imagination. The fabrics or gauze mainly had religious magical purposes and were used to cover the heads of the dead in the style of headdresses. Regarding the art made with feathers, they were inserted into a main thread that was then sewn onto the fabric. The iconography of their cloaks mainly represented fish, felines, birds, monkeys and dogs, especially the hairless dog of Peru. In Chanque, human heads carved in wood are common, crowning the funeral bundles of important dignitaries. Architecturally, this civilization stood out for creating large urban centers with pyramid-shaped mounds and complex buildings. It was organized by different types of settlements or alas and controlled by Caracas or leaders and the urban centers stood out with the typical constructions for civic religious dedications, also including residential palaces. The constructions were mainly made of mass-produced adobe based on molds. ECMA Culture ECMA is the name of a manor or of ancient Peru that flourished on the central coast of Peru, in part of the current department of Lima between the years 900 and 1470 of the Christian era. According to Antonio de la Calenca's statement, ICMA should be synonymous with limpi, a name applied to quicksilver and its vermilion color, used as makeup in various rituals. It is very evident that this color had a special religious meaning for the ICMA's priests. The walls of the Pacacamic temples were painted that color. This sanctuary was the seat of a divinity greatly worshipped by the inhabitants. Thanks to its oracle, they could predict the future or project its development. The inhabitants of the coastal valleys and even those of the mountain ranges came on a pilgrimage there to make inquiries of the god. The idol of the god was carved from wood and kept in a small chamber. Its prestige would be maintained throughout the Inca period, lasting until the Spanish conquest. The population would be divided according to their specialization, fishermen, farmers, merchants, artisans. The main economic activities were agriculture, fishing and the trade of surplus products. They took advantage of and improved the excellent network of canals or irrigation ditches inherited from the Lima culture, with which they gained extensive areas for cultivation. The Lima Valley was very fertile and provided subsistence for a large population. The large ceremonial enclosures, in addition to their religious function, served as food warehouses and as manufacturing centers for luxury products. Important architectural expressions are truncated pyramids built with adobes. These monuments basically have two characteristics. The massive use of rammed earth or large adobes. The presence of large access ramps. Shinsha culture. The Chincha culture flourished between the years 900 to 1450, it developed in the valleys of Canet, Chincha, Pisco, Ica, and Nazca. It is confirmed that they constituted a militaristic regional state that entered the Andean region, which offered tenacious resistance to the advance of the Inca Empire. The Chincha culture was conquered by the Incas during the reign of Pacacutec Inca Yupanqui and definitively incorporated into the empire during the government of Tupac Inca Yupanqui, around the year 1476. Chincha was a manner that maintained its importance even during the Inca era. What's more, it is even said that the only lord who could be carried after the same ceremony as the Inca Sapa was the lord of Chincha. Chinchacamac was its main god and Irpi Wache, which means she who gives birth to doves, was her sanctuary that refers to Awaka, female goddess, wife of Pacacamac, they believed that her gods came from that island. Their palaces were sanctuaries and huacas. The Chinches, like other cultures of the Peruvian coast, developed architecture and used the adobe or rammed earth technique. Motivated by the economic expansion of the Chincha culture, they sailed the sea on large rafts, it is confirmed that they reached the current port of Valdivia now located in Chile, south to Central America, 
one of the exports was spondylus shells. They had an ability to trade, they had a system of weights, measures and scales, so they exchanged their products. The power of King Chincha was thanks to the number of rafts he had. At the time of Chincha's development, there was no lord or king who could beat the king of Chincha in this. It is said that he had a fleet of about 200 of them, with which he traded along the entire coast of the Mar de Grau, to Central America. Chinchano products reached the Caribbean, which must be true, since the Chinchanos marketed their products at the mouth of the San Juan River, from their Chipchas merchants took it along the course of the San Juan River to the Caribbean Sea, they traded, chuno, charca de lama, various wools, copper, salted fish, pumpkin, corn and huacos. They brought emeralds and other precious stones. Ceramics it was decorated with two-color paint, black and white, on a red background, its representations were especially small geometric motifs imitating textile designs, other times they were birds and fish. The most common shapes are ovoid jugs with a wide mouth, bell-shaped cups, plates with vertical walls and a flat or convex base, and horizontal barrels with a mouth at the top. Among the objects found in the rich tombs are the so-called Narragones vases that represented a face with an aquiline nose. They were made of gold, silver, copper alloy, and are usually accompanied by corn, fish, snakes or birds. Topic 6. The Tawantan Suyo. The majestic territory of the Incas was called Tawantan Suyo, a compound name that comes from two Quechua words, Tawa which means four, and Suyo which means nation or state. In the Quechua sense it is a whole divided into four portions of the world. The word Costco means navel of the world, or center of the world in this case it was the center of the Inca Empire, the center of Tawantinsuyo. From the main square of Cusco there were four main roads leading to the four nations during the Inca era. Chinche yours. It covers the Ancashmayo River in Pasta, Colombia. With you yours. Towards the northwest, occupying a large part of the Peruvian coast, reaching the Mall River in Chile. Cala yours. It was occupied by the entire territory that is today Bolivia up to Tucumán in Argentina. Anti yours. It covered all the subtropical valleys, occupying the low jungle. The period of their rule is also known as Inca and Inca. It flourished in the Andean zone of the subcontinent between the 15th and 16th centuries, as a consequence of the height of the Inca civilization. It covered nearly 2 million square kilometers. The origins of the empire date back to the victory of the Cusco ethnic groups, southern region of present-day Peru, led by Pacacutec, against the Confederation of Chanca States, 1438. After the victory, the Inca Kiracasco was reorganized by Pacacutec, with whom the Inca Empire began a stage of continuous expansion, which continued with his brother Capac Yupanqui, then by the 10th Inca Tupac Yupanqui, and finally by the 11th Inca Huayna Capac, who consolidated the territories. In this stage, the Inca civilization achieved the maximum expansion of its culture, technology and science, developing its own knowledge and that of the Andean region as well as assimilating that of other conquered states. Lands of the Sun The Inca Empire divided the lands into three groups, the lands of the Inca, the lands of the Sun and the lands of the Alas. It is confirmed that the lands that were worked by the peasants for the maintenance of the Inca, the nobles and the army, received the name of the lands of the Inca. In addition, the peasants also worked the lands of the Sun, but for the maintenance of the priests and the aklas the products were destined for ceremonies, rituals and offerings to the gods on festival days. The lands that were given to the communities were rationed annually by the Kiraka. When two people got married, they were given land so that they could survive. And more land was attributed to them every time a child was born. The Cadus the Cadiz or agricultural exchange fairs, using the barter technique, were open places located in the corners of the squares or on a wide street. One or two days a week were allocated to carry out the exchange, they were not carried out permanently. The settlers arrived towards the Cadiz and were located according to the products they carried. 
There the seller stood behind his products placed in rows and piles, then the interested parties approached with other products and agreed to exchange. A Punchik The A Punchik had political powers, but mostly military ones. He resided in a fortress, since he had command of troops and the power to increase them. His main task was to maintain order. He also assumed judicial and tax collection functions. Apparently, he had the Yaka Kamayak or Canal Superintendent as subordinates, the Hatton Nan Kamayak or Road Superintendent, and the Chaka Kamayak or Superintendent of Bridges. He traveled in a litter once a year to Cusco to attend the Inti Raimi Festival, an occasion that he took advantage of to present to the Inca and his imperial council, Tawantinsuyo Kamakik, a general report of his actions. The Tawantinsuyo Kamakik or Imperial Council was the highest political body of the Inca Empire, whose function was to advise the Inca or sovereign. He advised the Inca on important matters. He contributed powerfully to the conception of laws and the formulation of the government plan. Chuna La Chuna was another form of work carried out for the benefit of the Inca people by women in the event of natural disasters. These women were prepared to act in emergency cases, helping in rescue, dispensing medicine, healing and caring for the injured. We can compare this action with today's civil defense. The women who participated were maidens brought from various parts of the empire and received training in the Aklai Huasi, where they obtained knowledge of first aid, use of medicinal plants, weaving and preparations for the Indi Raimi festival. Metamese The Metamese could not modify the exchanges of their dresses and headdresses from their native peoples, and when they received the order to move, they did so with their belongings, seeds and goods, and preserving their own customs and traditions. Keeping their badges allowed state administrators to quickly recognize and differentiate upstarts from locals. The Mitamis were the families destined to certain places to colonize lands, defend the security of the state and spread the Inca culture. They therefore fulfilled political, economic and cultural functions. The most common political and strategic function of these displacements was the need of the Inca Empire to divide the populations that posed a threat to the Quechua Inca elites, in this way these eradications served to weaken the weight of a native population in their ancestral territories to the resistance against the Incas and another was that the Inca confirmed that the conquered peoples did forced labor. The Quechuas imposed forced labor called Mita on the original populations subjected of degree, that is, on the ethnic groups and native populations to which the Quechua Incas gave them a choose between total war to be subjected to the Tawantinsuyo or becoming peacefully subjugated towns in which the chiefs and caciques with their families were transformed into Caracas of the Inca. Sapa Inca The Incas ruled over multiple cultures and ethnicities. From the capital Cusco, the navel of the world, the Inca domain extended towards the four of them. The Sapa Inca was the supreme emperor of Tawantinsuyo. The Capac Cradle or official list of Inca rulers is made up of 13 sovereigns, from the founding of Cusco, 1250, to the capture of Atahualpa, 1532. Capac Cuna has two dynasties. Huron Dynasty Cusco, Lower Cusco. Manco Capac, Powerful Boss. Sinchi Roca, Too Powerful. Lok Yupanki, memorable left-hander. Meta Kapak, where is the powerful? Kapak Yupanki, enduring, powerful. Hanan Dynasty Cusco, Upper Cusco. Inca Roca, be luminous. Yawar Waka, he who cries blood. Wairacocha, savior of the empire. Pakakutek, transformer of the world. Tupac Inca Yupanki, Luminous Glow. Huena Capac, Powerful Young Man. Huascar, Gold Chain. The word Inca comes from the Pukina Inca, which means life-generating principle or original model of all things. Sapa is a Quechua word that means big. So the Sapa Inca translates as the great vital principle of everything that exists in the world. Inti. The Quechuas of the Inca Empire had the sun god on the first step of the celestial ladder, with the sacred name of Inti. 
Inti was represented in the shape of a golden ellipsoid in which rays could also appear as another of his power attributes, and the moon had the ritual shape of a silver disc. Inti is also used in the Interami festivals. As a creator, he was adored and revered, but people also went to him for favors and help, to solve problems and alleviate needs, since only he could give birth. Crops, cure diseases, and provide the security that human beings require. Yachawasi The Yachawasi, House of Knowledge, was the place where adolescent males of the Inca nobility were prepared with the necessary knowledge for administration and government, that is, the future members of the ruling class. It was founded by the Inca called Inca Roca in Cusco, approximately in 1350. Teaching in the Yachawasi was in charge of the Amautas, the teachers or wise men of the empire who taught four main subjects. Quechua language. Official religion, sun god. Management and interpretation of quipus, including mathematics. Military history of the empire. Additionally, physical and military training was received. Caracas. They were the heads of each Elu, who served as intermediaries between the Inca state and the ethnic groups, to ensure the production and availability of the labor force of the Hatton Runas of the Mita. Originally he must have been the oldest or the oldest, wise and ruled in a paternalistic manner. He lived in a large house with a large servant of both sexes. He had several wives, coming from his own Elu or from neighboring towns, and sometimes even given as a special favor by the Inca himself. They enjoyed multiple benefits, especially from the Hatton Kiraka who were the lords of an entire nation, whose children were educated in the Yachawasi along with the nobility of Cusco, but they had to demonstrate total subordination to the imperial state. The Caracas did not act alone, they shared their power with a Yanapek or second person, who was usually a close relative, or usually his brother, who replaced him when he became ill, aged or physically incapacitated or absent. The supreme badge of his authority was a wooden seat barely 20 centimeters high. Platforms The best known form is the construction of artificial agricultural platforms or terraces for the planting of different products, commonly associated with the cultivation of corn. The platforms have been known since times long before the Incas, but it should be noted that during the Inca period the construction of the platforms was greatly widespread throughout Tontensuyu. For the construction of platforms, all ethnic groups or cultures subject to the Incas were obliged to provide one-seventh of the number of family heads who were assigned to the construction of platforms during the Tontensuyu. Utility of the platforms The usefulness of the platforms was multiple. Among them we have 1. To enable the land for planting on the steep Andean slopes. Thus they managed to expand the agricultural frontier. 2. They made it possible to make better use of water, both rain and irrigation, making it circulate through the channels that connected the various levels of the platforms. 3. It prevented hydraulic erosion of the soil. It is very possible that there were platforms intended only to prevent erosion, and there were also those for different uses, such as washing mineral salt. 4. It formed microclimates and retained moisture. Sports activity practiced by the Incas The Incas practiced sports disciplines, not as a sport in itself, but rather as the fulfillment of a duty. Many young people, when fulfilling their tasks for the state, were employed as chaskis, types of human couriers traveling several kilometers a day, carrying and bringing news and orders from the authorities. They traveled enormous distances until a point where they were relieved by others who continued the journey with the same assignment. This today, sportingly speaking, would be something like marathon races, relay races, obstacle races, etc. Another sport practiced very often by the Incas was wrestling in which young people with the right to run for government faced each other in hand-to-hand -hand fights in which the winner was recognized as the future ruler. Fall of Tawantin Suyo Capitulation of Burgos Once the distribution of territories between Spain and Portugal was finalized, Treaty of Tordesillas, the process of incorporating American lands into the peninsular monarchical domain began. 
For Spain, the colonies were productive centers, mainly of precious metals, gold and silver, and a large market for their products. Thus, the crown's priority was to ensure the rapid discovery of wealth in the New World. To do so, it dazzled seasoned expeditionaries with noble titles, royal recognition, and wealth, which were formalized through a capitulation. For this reason, adventurers, noblemen, and illiterate commoners who in Spain worked as artisans or peasants believed they saw in the New World the opportunity to make a name for themselves, rise socially, and amass a great fortune. The governorates were established as the first system of colonial administration. Through these, it was intended to facilitate colonization. In addition, expeditions to unexplored areas departed from there. Panquiaco, the son of Comagor, one of the most powerful chiefs on the Panamanian Atlantic coast, reproached the Spaniards for their greed and sent them to a land to the south, abundant in gold and bathed by the sea. Panquiaco's indignation at the greed of the Spanish led him to reveal the details of the existence of a land abundant in gold and bathed to the south by a new sea. The scene witnessed by Panquiaco was a voracious dispute between the soldiers of Vasco Nunez de Balboa to seize the best pieces of gold that their father offered them, as a sign of peace and as a strategy so that their chieftain would not suffer the same fate as others, in which there was death and destruction. Seeing the thirst for gold that the Spaniards had and their disdain for the jewels offered by his father caused Panquiaco to reproach the soldiers for destroying the beautiful jewels only to turn them into tasteless gold ingots. Levant Company. In 1524, with great emotion, Francisco Pizarro, Diego de Almagro, and Hernando de Luque founded the Levant Company in Panama. In the first days of September of the same year, two ships were already ready. The Santiago and the San Cristobal. On the 13th, the Santiago set sail under the command of Francisco Pizarro, with 112 Spaniards and some Nicaraguan Indians on duty. From Panama, they headed to the Pearl Islands. Then they landed in Puerto Pinas. They advanced along the Colombian coast until they reached a point they called Puerto de Hambra, because the provisions ran out and the ship San Cristobal did not appear to help them. Then Pizarro sent Gil de Montenegro with the Santiago to collect food on the Pearl Islands. For 47 days, he waited for the captain in Puerto de Hambra. When Montenegro arrived, more than 30 expedition members had already died due to lack of food. After the failed first expedition in 1524, which only increased Pizarro's scars and left Almagro one-eyed and the three partners impoverished. A new contract is signed after obtaining the license, thanks to the efforts of Luque, with the money of Gaspar de Espinosa, and after having delivered 1,000 castellanos of gold to Pedro Arias de Vila, Pedrarias, governor of Tierra Firme, and obtaining the license, who, in exchange for the aforementioned sum, separated from the company. The agreement stated that the clergyman Hernando de Luque contributed 20,000 gold castellanos for the expenses of the expedition. This money actually came from Gaspar de Espinosa, a capitalist partner of the three in the first expedition and responsible for the processing and beheading of Nunez de Balboa. Pizarro and Almagro, deprived of capital after the first adventure, contributed their people and the ability to make this conquest. Likewise, they agreed to divide everything found between the three. According to tradition, the pact was formalized before God and before men in a mass celebrated by Luque himself, in which the three partners took communion with a piece of the same host. The Levant Company was a prototype of a private company in the conquest of America, a type of public limited company. Pizarro's second voyage. Pizarro and Almagro were very cautious that the letters that the soldiers sent to their families did not reach Panama. To prevent their complaints from becoming known to the authorities, in Panama, Diego de Almagro, however, had difficulties because in a ball of wool that had been sent as a gift to Catalina de Saavedra, wife of Pedro de los Rios, Pedrarias' successor, a disgruntled soldier had hidden the following couplet: "Well, Mr. Governor, take a good look at everything. Here is the picker, and here is the butcher." In this way, the sufferings of the expedition members are revealed. The governor prevented the departure of Diego de Almagro with new aid, and, on the contrary, sent a ship under the command of Captain Juan Tafur to pick up Pizarro and his companions, 
who were they were on the island of Gallo. The total discontent among Pizarro's soldiers was very great, since they had been experiencing calamities for a long time. They had spent two and a half years traveling south, facing all kinds of dangers, without achieving any results. Pizarro tried to convince his men to move on, however, most of them wanted to desert and return to Panama. There were a total of 80 men who were on Gallo Island, all thin and haggard, of which 20 could not stand. Tafur arrived on the island of Gallo in August 1527, amidst the joy of Pizarro's men, who thus sought his sufferings ended. It was at that moment when Pizarro's epic action took place, he drew a line with his sword in the sands of the island, exhorting his men to decide whether or not to continue on the discovery expedition. Only 13 men crossed the line. These 13 of fame were Nicolas de Ribera, Old Pedro de Alcón Alonso Brasino Pedro de Candia Anton de Cari and Francisco de Cuellar Garcia de Geron Alonso de Molina Cristobal de Peralta Domingo de Sorales Juan de la Torre Martín de Paz Gonzalo Martín de Trujillo, who died shortly after on Gorgona Island, so his position was occupied by the pilot Bartolomé Ruiz. Civil War between Huáscar and Atahualpa The dispute over the Inca crown caused the civil war between Huáscar and Atahualpa, marking the fall of the Inca Empire. The triumphant monarch, Atahualpa, would not enjoy his victory much since the Spanish were already stepping on Tahuantinsuyo territories. The Succession of the Throne The legitimate heir, designated by Huayna Capac, was his son Prince Nainan Kuluchi, who died almost at the same time as his father, victim of a strange plague that devastated the Ecuadorian region, probably it was smallpox brought by the Spanish and which spread from Panama. But since even in life, Huayna Capac had designated Huáscar as second successor to the imperial throne, so he gave the Mascapeca that accredited him as ruler of Tahuantinsuyo to which his bastard brother Atahualpa also aspired, who, having been born in Cusco, had been assimilated into the new nobility of Quito and, in this way, sought his ambitions postponed. The Civil War Huáscar, enraged because his brother had not accompanied his father's remains from Quito to Cusco, nor had he come to pay him homage of submission and loyalty, punished with death the embassy that Atahualpa had sent him to present his excuses for his non-attendance to Cusco. Huáscar thought in this way, to make his authority felt. But he did not succeed since this attitude of the Cusco ruler provoked the uprising of Atahualpa, triggering the civil war. The crowned Inca Sapa Huáscar achieved initial successes. General Atac, sent by him, managed to defeat Atahualpa's hosts in the Battle of Tumipampa. Atahualpa was taken prisoner, but managed to escape. He reorganized his army and undertook the offensive, advancing south and counting on the collaboration of his father's former generals such as Quisquis, Calcucamac and Rumiñoi. Near Cusco they defeated Huáscar's army in the Battle of Capay Pampa. Atahualpa's triumphant army descended on the imperial city, which was looted and completely destroyed. Huáscar was taken prisoner and forced to witness this destruction. He sought not to leave vestiges of what the city of Cusco had been, as well as of its arrogant imperial nobility. In this way the fall of Tahuantinsuyo was accelerated. Imperial power was weakened. Atahualpa, after the victory of his generals, returned north, stopping in Cajamarca. Under these circumstances, the Spanish made their appearance on the coasts of Tums. Later, Atahualpa was taken prisoner by the Spanish invaders and, from there, he would have his brother Huáscar killed, who was still in prison. In turn, he was executed on July 26, 1533. Capture of the Inca Atahualpa the capture of Atahualpa was considered a surprise attack on the monarch of the Inca Empire carried out by Francisco Pizarro and his troops. It happened on the afternoon of November 16, 1532, in the main square of Cajamarca. Francisco Pizarro entrusted Hernando de Soto with the mission of going to the Inca to invite him to come and dine with him in Cajamarca. Soto and his men arrived in Paltamarca. 
The Inca was resting in a palace located in the middle of a cultivated meadow, located a little further back from the Inca camp. About 400 Inca warriors, deployed in the meadow, guarded the Inca's residence. Soto and his men, after crossing the camp, arrived at the door of the palace and, without getting off their horses, sent Felipillo to request the presence of the Inca. And Orijan, an Inca noble, went to his lord with the message and the Spaniards were left waiting for a response. Pizarro addressed Soto asking him the reason for his delay, the bigyard Sequinchera left the palace to observe the situation and then returned inside, informing Atahualpa that the same Spaniard who had destroyed him in Pochos, seat of the Curacasco of Mezavilca, was outside. In Pura, when he was spying on the Spanish camp. It was then that Atahualpa decided to go out, walking towards the door of the palace and proceeding to sit on a red bench, always behind a curtain that only revealed his silhouette. In this way, he could observe the enemy without being seen. Hernando Pizarro, feeling displaced, told Martinillo to tell the Inca that there was no difference between him and Captain Soto, because both were captains of his majesty. But Atahualpa did not flinch, while he took two gold glasses, full of corn liquor, which two women handed him. Then, the Inca offered the Spaniards the glasses of liquor, but they, fearful that the drink was poisoned, excused themselves from drinking it, saying that they were fasting. To which the Inca replied saying that he was also fasting and that liquor in no way broke the fast. To dispel any fear, the Inca took a sip from each of the glasses, which calmed the Spaniards, who then drank the liquor. Soto, mounted on his horse, immediately wanted to show off and began to gallop, prancing before the Inca, he suddenly advanced on the monarch as if wanting to run him over, but he stopped short. Soto was amazed to see that the Inca had remained unchanged. He ended the interview with Atahualpa's promise to go the next day to meet Francisco Pizarro. Atahualpa accepted the invitation and presided over a slow and ceremonious march of thousands of his subjects, mostly dancers, musicians and service bearers. Inside Cajamarca, the Spanish had already made preparations to lay a trap for the Inca. Pizarro divided his horsemen into two groups, one under the command of Hernando Pizarro and the other under the command of Hernando de Soto. Bells were placed on the horses so that they made more noise when galloping. The infantrymen were also divided into two groups, one under the command of Francisco Pizarro himself and the other under the command of Juan Pizarro, all of these troops were deployed strategically. The Inca, loaded on a litter, was led to the center of the plaza, where he ordered his carriers to stop. He was surprised to see no Spaniards and asked his spy sequentra where they were all. Some of his captains responded that the Spaniards were hiding out of fear. Suddenly, a bearded man dressed in a black and white habit approached Atahualpa, it was the friar Vicente de Valverde, accompanied by an indigenous interpreter Felipillo. Valverde, carrying a cross and a breviary, began the so-called requerimiento, ordering Atahualpa to renounce his pagan religion and instead accept Catholicism as his faith and Charles I of Spain as sovereign. Atahualpa felt insulted and confused by these demands of the Spanish. Atahualpa had no intention of acceding to the demands of the Spanish. The Inca noticed that Valverde was looking at his breviary before pronouncing the phrases of the requirement and with curiosity he asked for it. The priest explained to him that the divine plan of his religion was found there and that the word of God came from there. Atahualpa took the book, examined it and put it to his ear, becoming indignant because he did not hear anything nor did he feel that this object was that powerful, so he threw it very far in fury shouting that he would not submit to anyone because he was the son of the sun, also demanded that the Spanish pay for the misdeeds they had committed since their arrival on the soil of his kingdom. Valverde, who ran to Pizarro, who then addressed the Spanish soldiers, telling them that the Inca had thrown the Gospels on the ground and rejected the requerimiento, so he encouraged them to go out and fight the idolater, that they would have absolution. Thus, Pizarro ordered his men to take action. They came out with a bang, sweeping everything in front of them, followed by a troop of blacks and Indians with armor, rapiers, and spears. Simultaneously, the other squad of Spaniards opened fire with their muskets from a long distance. 
Great chaos ensued, as the few armed warriors did not have time to draw their batons, which were not much help against the Spanish distant shots and horses. The majority of the Indian mass tried to leave the complex to get away from the massacre, and as the only main door was crowded, they charged against one of the walls, making a hole in it, and left the complex. The main target of the Spanish attack was Atahualpa and his commanders. Pizarro rode towards where Atahualpa was, but the Inca did not move. The Spaniards cut off the hands or arms of the assistants carrying Atahualpa's litter to force them to drop it and reach him. The Spaniards were surprised because the attendants, ignoring his injuries, and with their limbs still healthy, held the litter until several of them were killed and the litter overturned. Atahualpa remained seated on the litter while a large number of attendants rushed to place themselves between the litter and the Spaniards, leaving the Spaniards to kill them. Atahualpa's wife, Kaksira Mayaklo, who was between 13 and 15 years old at the time, was with the army and accompanied Atahualpa while he was a prisoner. After her execution she was taken to Cusco and adopted the name Dona Angelina. By 1538 she was the concubine of Francisco Pizarro, with whom she had two sons, Juan and Francisco. After Pizarro was assassinated in 1541, she married the interpreter Juan de Batanzos. The Death of Atahualpa As night fell on July 26, Atahualpa was taken to the center of the Plaza de Cajamarca. Surrounded by the Spanish soldiers and the priest Valverde, they tied him to a log nail to the middle of the square and piled logs at his feet. A Spaniard approached with a lit torch. Atahualpa, upon seeing that they were going to burn him, was alarmed, because according to the Inca religion, his body had to be embalmed to achieve his resurrection in the other world, which would not be possible if he was consumed by the flames. He then spoke with Valverde, who offered him as an alternative to be baptized as a Christian and then hanged on the vile garrote that way his body could be buried. Atahualpa accepted and was baptized there with the Christian name of Francisco. They then strangled him. According to the soldier chronicler Miguel de Estite, during the ceremony a group of women made up of sisters, wives and servants of Atahualpa, entered the church and offered to bury themselves alive with the dead monarch, since that was the custom at the funeral of an Inca the Spanish responded that Atahualpa had died as a Christian and that this custom was contrary to the doctrines of Christianity. But the women were not satisfied. They bit their wrists, tore their breasts, and finally hanged themselves with their hair. Pizarro left the church to restore order and prevent more suicides from occurring. The Incas of Vilcabamba the resistance of Vilcabamba is called the presence of a part of the Inca elite in this region of Cusco that settled seeking to re-establish the Inca organization. It lasted approximately 40 years, from the arrival of the Spanish to Peru in 1532 until the first years of the government of Viceroy Toledo. This resistance is related to the destructuring of the Andean world and the consolidation of the viceroyalty in Peruvian territory. It must be understood that this rebellion was the response of the Inca elites to recompose and achieve their power again using violent confrontations with the peninsulars. They were the four successor monarchs of Atahualpa, legitimate heirs of Huayna Capac, who faced the dismantling of the Inca Empire by the Spanish invaders and their indigenous Andean allies, who formed the resistance of the Cusco elite ruling over a small but influential Inca state. Called many times the Neo-Inca Empire of Vilcabamba between 1537 and 1572. Inca Manco Manco Inca obtained the support and trust of the Spanish. As soon as he entered Cusco, the Mascapeca was placed, and with the presence of the Inca elite and important Caracas he became Inca. However, he would quickly become disillusioned with his allies, as the new Inca was treated as a figurehead who no longer served the peninsular interests. He tried to leave Cusco twice and was arrested, even being chained for breaking his promise of alliance. Around 1535 Manco Inca took action to reconquer Cusco. After making several promises to his oppressors, saying that he would bring the statues of the Cusco rulers, Manco Inca managed to leave Cusco and organize the attack on the imperial city. 
The Wilak Ulmo, the most important member of the Tawantan Suyo religious sector, was at the Inca side in this difficult undertaking. The Caracas of the surrounding towns and the Sacred Valley responded to the call and Manco Inca managed to form a large army of approximately 10,000 men. Taking advantage of the absence of Diego de Almagro, who went with Wilak Umu and Palu, brother of Manco Inca to Chile, Manco Inca besieged Cuzco for nine months, constantly besieging the Spanish forces stationed in the sacred city. Sacsayhuaman was an important scene in the battles of Cusco and precisely in one of these confrontations Juan Pizarro, brother of the conqueror, died. Manco Inca was murdered in 1545 by an Almagrist to whom he had given refuge after the wars against the Pizarrists. The Inca's successors continued to harass the Spanish while they began a series of negotiations with them to reach a definitive peace. Seri Tupac Seri Tupac was the son of Manco Inca and Culcha Macape. He was declared the legitimate heir when Manco Inca died and took his older sister Cusi Huarque as his main wife. Seri Tupac began negotiations with the new Spanish government, which put him at odds with the rest of the Vilcabamba elite. He even left his kingdom to travel to Lima where he was received with honors. Apparently at that time Tidakusi Yupanqui acquired de facto power and organized the Vilcabamba government. Seri Tupac, after obtaining immunity and ownership of the lands of the Yuki Valley, Sacred Valley or Urubamba, where he built a mansion in Yuki, where he died a few years later. He accepted baptism. Titakusi Yupanqui Titakusi Yupanqui regained control of the Inca resistance. This new Inca declared himself an enemy of Spanish interests, initially organizing hostile expeditions to the towns near Vilcabamba. At the same time he contacted Governor Lope Garcia de Castro, trying to reach an agreement beneficial to the rebels. He signed the capitulation of Acabamba in 1566 and in said treaty the hostilities were ended and the acts committed by the rebels were forgiven. He was baptized along with his family in 1568, a fact that was not welcomed by the most radical Caracas. The Inca died suddenly of a strange illness. The Augustinian missionaries who managed to enter after the capitulation were seen as responsible for the death, since in their eagerness to help they gave him concoctions that the Andeans thought was poison. The missionary Diego Ortiz was found guilty, tortured and executed. The Spaniards and Mestizos who were in Vilcabamba were also executed. The elite looked for a successor and so his brother Tupac Amaru held the scepter and wore the mascapeca at the beginning of 1571. Tupac Amaru The youngest of Tita Cusi's brothers then took command, fire serpent known as Tupac Amaru I. The new Sapa Inca formed an army and placed it under the command of the generals Walpa Yupanqui, Cory Parker Yayo and Kala Tupac. He denounced the Treaty of Acabamba, expelled the Spanish from Vilcabamba, closed its borders and proclaimed that he was fighting for the restoration of Tawantan Suyo. The Viceroy of Peru, Francisco Alvarez de Toledo, fifth ruler of Hispanic Peru, who ruled between 1569 to 1581, who had already received from Spain the complies that included the bull that authorized the marriage of Quispe Tidu, on July 20, in 1571, he sent the Dominican Gabriel de Oviedo and the lawyer Garcia de los Rios to Vilcabamba to deliver the documents to Tupac Amaro Inca and solve the problem peacefully. This commission was not received by Tupac Amaro Inca and he had to return to Cusco. Finding the viceroy in Cusco, he sent Telano de Anaya with a threatening letter to the Sapa Inca. While crossing the Chukwachaca Bridge, he was killed by those loyal to Tupac Amaru. Once the fact was known, Viceroy Toledo decided to end the conversations and the Concordat with Vilcabamba, sending a military expedition under the command of Martin Garcia Juans de Loyola, Martin Hurtado de Arbieto and Juan Alvarez Maldonado, to occupy Vilcabamba with blood and fire. He offered the Nusta Beatriz, heir to the wealth of her father Seri Tupac, as a trophy in marriage for whoever captured the Inca. With the help of reports from multiple spies, the Spanish expedition managed to bypass the defenses of Vilcabamba, destroy Vitcos and capture, after a long chase, the young king.
He was captured and after a summary trial in the empire's former capital, Tupac Amaru, he was beheaded in May 1572. With his death, the conquest of Peru officially ended. The Capitulation of Toledo The Capitulation of Toledo of 1529 is a royal decree issued on July 26, 1529 in Toledo by the Crown of Castile, through which the conqueror Francisco Pizarro was granted in advance, within the framework of the Spanish conquest and colonization of America. This document was signed by Queen Consort Isabel of Portugal, with powers delegated by order of her husband, King Charles I of Spain, who was absent in Cortes, the Count of Osorna, Garcia Fernandez Manrique, President of the Council of the Indies, and Dr. Diego Beltran. Through this capitulation, Pizarro received authorization for the conquest and population of the province of Peru or Nueva Castilla, from the town of Tempala or Santiago, coast of present-day Ecuador, to the town of Chincha, coast of present-day Peru, between both points there was a distance of 200 leagues. Much of this area, which extended along the coast of the then-called South Sea, had already been discovered and explored by Pizarro and his partner, Captain Diego de Almagro, in the five years prior to the signing of the capitulation. This agreement meant Pizarro's personal triumph at the expense of his partners, Almagro and Luque, due to the enormous advantages and benefits he derived from it. In this way, the conquest of Peru or Tahuantinsuyo was legalized and legitimized by the Spanish crown itself. The Civil War Among the Conquerors The immediate cause of the war between Pizarro and Diego de Almagro was the possession of Cusco, both Pizarro and Almagro claimed to have possession rights over the imperial capital of the Incas. The dispute between the conquerors of Peru over the distribution of the lands and wealth of the Inca Empire. The root of all this was in the capitulation of Toledo, adjusted between Francisco Pizarro and the Spanish crown, in which the former achieved many privileges, to the detriment of the rest of his partners, Diego de Almagro and Hernando de Luque. Added to this is that it was common practice for Pizarro to dispose of the loot as he pleased, which further deepened the differences with his partner Almagro, who found himself marginalized in the distribution of the wealth. Particularly, a fierce and mutual hatred was incubated between Almagro and Hernando Pizarro, Francisco's brother. Two sides were thus defined, the Almagrists and the Pizarristas, accusing each other of treason and of not respecting commitments. It should be noted that the other partner in the conquest, the priest Luque, did not intervene in these disputes since he died shortly after the conquest began. The Jacquijuana Battle among the captains loyal to the king who joined the forces of La Gasca, Alonso de Alvarado, the conqueror of Chachapoyas, stood out. Finally, after some initial skirmishes, the battle that would ensure control of Peru was inevitable. The two armies met nearby in the Pampa de Anta or Saxawana, called by the Spanish Jacquijuana, near Cusco. At the moment the battle began, Pizarro's forces were inferior in number and practically all of them went over to Legasca's army, with the oiter Diego Vasquez de Cepeda and Captain Sebastián Garcileso de la Vega beginning to disband, so there was no major struggle. Gonzalo Pizarro, along with his most loyal commander, Francisco de Carvajal, nicknamed the Demon of the Andes, were captured on the battlefield and beheaded. The Battle of Sux, Ayacucho It took place on September 16, 1542 between Vaca de Castro and Almagro El Mozo, the result was the triumph of the lawyer's army. Almagro El Mozo was beheaded in the same place where his father died. In fact, when the royalists advanced in a straight line towards the Almagrist positions, the rival cannons began to thunder, threatening to tear them to pieces. Francisco de Carvajal, seeing that his people were rushing to certain death, led them along another path, making a detour along a hill that covered them from enemy fire, but when they came out onto the open field, in the sights of the Almagris cannons, they did not harm them because their shot went over the top. Almagro then suspected that his artillery captain Pedro de Candia had sold himself to the enemy, and that for this reason he was intentionally firing very high shots, furious, he threw himself at him and killed him with spears. Then he himself positioned one of the cannons and fired, sweeping away a royalist column. 
The Royalist infantry was then unable to advance, at the risk of being annihilated. Carvajal wanted to advance the four falconets that his army had to oppose them to the powerful Almagris artillery. But he abandoned that plan, as it delayed the actions too much and he preferred to call the cavalry to help, which was more numerous than that of the Almagritas. The Royalist cavalry then charged furiously against the Almagrist positions. Almagro then made the mistake of abandoning his advantageous position, ordering his people to respond to the enemy charge by going out to fight in the open field, this meant stopping using the cannons so as not to cause damage to their own. That decision changed the course of action because until then victory seemed to smile on the Almagrists. The encounter was terrible. What made the fight more fierce was the fact that it decided who would be the masters of Peru and its wealth and the defeated would inevitably end up dead in the field, executed. Those loyal to the king shouted, Long live the king and Vaca de Castro, and the Almagro rebels shouted, Long live the king and Almagro. Diego de Almagro el Mozo managed to flee at full gallop, but shortly after he was captured and executed in Cusco. Battle of the Warinas Gonzalo Pizarro faced off against Diego Centeno. The Battle of Warina or the Warinas pitted the rebel forces of Gonzalo Pizarro and the royalist forces led by Diego Centeno on October 20, 1547 on the Warina Plain near Lake Titicaca in Upper Peru, today Bolivia. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the civil wars between the conquerors of Peru. Its result was the triumph of the rebels thanks to the harquebusier skillfully used by the field master Francisco de Carvajal but it did not prevent the Gonzalez side from being definitively defeated the following year, in Jacquijuana. In 1542, Emperor Charles first signed the royal decree that created the Viceroyalty of Peru. By virtue of such creation, Blasco Núñez de Vela was appointed first viceroy. He arrived in Peru with the intention of enforcing the recently promulgated new laws, which suppressed hereditary encomiendas. This caused the rebellion of the encomenderos, confronting the viceroy. For this purpose, they appointed Gonzalo Pizarro, at the time a wealthy encomendero of Charcas, present-day Sucre, in Bolivia, their leader and head of the army. Topic 7. The Bourbonic Reforms. Rebellion of Juan Santos Atahualpa. Juan Santos Atahualpa was a mestizo descendant of the Inca nobility who in 1742 revolted with the aim of expelling the Spanish and restoring the Tahuantinsuyo, but integrating blacks and mestizos. The rebellion broke out in the Gran Paginal region, located in the central jungle, where the native Ashaninkas, Shipibos, Canabos, Paras and Shiriminks were fed up with Spanish oppression, which began with the Franciscan missionaries and extended with the arrival of authorities and military from Lima. With the support of the Caracas of the Perin River he established his headquarters in Quisapango, near Chanchameo. Upon finding out, the Viceroy Marquis of Villagarcia ordered troops from Jaja and Tarma to attack the rebels and capture their leader. However, at the end of 1742, after bloody fighting, the royalist soldiers retreated and took refuge in Jaja. In 1745, the crown sent the Count of Superunda as the new viceroy, who also ordered to attack the Inca, but his troops also failed. Then, he ordered the fortification of Christian villages near the border to defend them from jungle rebels. Meanwhile, Juan Santos Atahualpa organized a government in the liberated region and prepared his forces to attack Tarma and Jaja, previous steps towards the capture of Lima, the capital of Peru. In 1752, the Inca advanced towards Jaja and managed to take Andamarca, but he was unable to get the mountain Caracas to join the rebellion. Alerted to the approach of new colonial troops, he retreated towards his bastions in the Gran Paginal. Many natives, especially the Ashaninkas and Canabos, maintained hope for his return for a long time to come. Tupac Amaru Tupac Amaru II revolted in the town of Tinta. The rebellion of Tupac Amaru II, begun in 1780, constituted the highest expression of struggle of the indigenous masses during the colony. This rebellion had an anti-feudal and anti-colonial character. 
The uprising began on November 4, 1780, after a party held in celebration of the birth of Charles III. He took Ariaga prisoner and took him to Tungasuka, forcing him to sign a letter addressed to his cashier Mendieta, in which he ordered him to send him all available funds and all accessible weapons. Once his assignment was obtained, Tupac Camaro initiates a trial against Ariaga, who is sentenced to hanging and executed on November 10. The leader leaves the next day for Quiquajana, where he distributes the wool from a workshop, frees the prisoners and issues a proclamation of liberation for the blacks. After his victory in Sangarara on the 18th, he launched constant protests asking for the union of mestizo creoles, blacks, and Indians. The latter were so divided that some decided to join the royalists and others joined the rebellion. Among the royalist chiefs, Mateo Pumacawa stands out, among the rebels the chief Sabacos, Tomasa Tito Condameda. In 1780, the largest rebellion in the history of the Spanish colony in America began, discounting the wars of independence. That November 10, Jose Gabriel Condor Canqui, also called Tupac Amaru II, executed the mayor Antonio de Arriaga. The highest Spanish authority in the area was hanged on a scaffold whose rope was pulled, among others, by his own slave. The rebellion would last for years and expand southward, from Cusco to present-day Bolivia, becoming increasingly violent. The actions of the Tupacamarista and Catarista insurgents would continue until 1783. Tupac Amaru was defeated before. In May 1781, the Spanish authorities beheaded and dismembered him in a public ceremony in the Plaza de Armas in Cusco. Tupac Catari Julian Espesa, Tupac Catari, or simply Catari was an indigenous Aymira, son of a miner who died as a Mateo in the mines of Potosi. After being orphaned in adolescence, he began to serve as a priest's servant, becoming a bell ringer thanks to his uncle Manuel de L. Kiraka of a community neighboring Aoao, becoming the official bell ringer of the town's church. He then worked for two years as a laborer in the San Cristobal mine in Oruro, at first as a sweeper and then carrying pieces of ore. There he learned of the suffering of other indigenous people and began to proclaim the need to rebel. He moved to Sika Sika where he worked as a baker and where he met his partner Bartolina Sisa. He later worked as a retail merchant to La Paz, studying the way of thinking of the indigenous people, mestizos and cholos, especially observing their growing discontent with colonial exploitation. He was supported in his fight by his wife, Bartolina Sisa, and his younger sister Gregoria Apaza. He adopted the pseudonym Tupac Katari in homage to the second rebel Inca chief Tupac Amaru. The Court of Cadiz the Spanish did not recognize the figure of Joseph Bonaparte as their king. These boards aimed to defend against the French invasion and fill the power vacuum. They were made up of soldiers, representatives of the high clergy, officials and professors, all of them conservative, so even though the origin of the movement was revolutionary, the purpose would not maintain the same nature. In September, they cede their power to the Supreme Central Government Board of the Kingdom which will be in charge of the government of the country to direct the defense against the French. On November 19, 1809, the imperial troops defeated the army of the Central Junta in Okana, and the French had free passage to Andalusia. The Junta retired to Cadiz and on January 29, 1810, discredited by military defeats. The Constitution of 1812 it established a new economic and social order, since the certainty that all citizens who made up the nation were equal in rights and were subject to the same law forced the liquidation of the estate privileges that made up the society of the old regime. The Constitution also proclaimed the legal equality of all Spaniards, the inviolability of their home, criminal and procedural guarantees and abolished torture. He promulgated the right to education, a public good that the state had to ensure and that is why he established the creation of primary schools in all municipalities, as well as a general education plan, a general education law, common to the entire country. Another radical innovation was the equality of citizens before the tax. If all the citizens who made up the nation were free, everyone had to participate in the decisions that affected their future. 
For this reason, the Constitution established relative universal suffrage, limited to men over 25 years of age. It was, furthermore, a complex model of indirect suffrage, structured at three levels, the parish, the municipality, and the province. The citizens voted for the parish delegates, these elected municipal delegates and the municipal delegates elected the provincial delegates, who appointed the deputies to the Cortes. A similar model was applied to the election of city councils and provincial councils. Inspired by the political philosophy of the 18th century, the constitution established the division of powers, the executive fell in the hands of the king and his office secretaries, or ministers, the legislative was exercised by the unicameral Cortes and the judicial was the power of the courts of justice. Independent, common to the entire nation. As a consequence of the principle of national sovereignty, the legitimacy of the monarch did not come from divine origin, but from the nation gathered in the Cortes and the laws that they promoted. In addition to the constitution, the Cortes of Cadiz promulgated several decrees between 1810 and 1813 that dismantled the economic and social structures of the old regime. A decree of August 6, 1811 abolished the manor regime, the basic cell of local organization, measure of transcendental importance that had to precede the approval of the constitution. In the old regime, approximately half of the Spanish population lived under the manor regime. The feudal lords had full power to administer justice and appoint authorities in the lordship subject to their jurisdiction. To establish freedom of trade and industry, other decrees abolished internal customs, customs still existed between some territories, and proclaimed freedom of contracting, leasing and marketing of products. Another allowed the free use of the land without any impediment, authorizing the owners to fence their farms, something that until now was not possible due to the privileges of the Royal Council of La Mesta, an institution that brought together ranchers and guaranteed the passage free of the herds throughout the country. Dissolution of the Court of Cadiz Until May 1813, the jurisdiction of the Cortes of Cadiz was limited to the city itself. Their dominion expanded as the French retreated. On December 11, 1813, Ferdinand VII was restored to the throne by Napoleon. He returned to Spain in March 1814. At the beginning of May the Cortes was scheduled to meet for the first time in Madrid. But the king did not want to sanction a revolution that would undermine his power. He had the support of high military commanders, officials of the institutions liquidated by the liberals and a good part of the ecclesiastical hierarchy. He also had the connivance of almost a hundred absolutist deputies who demanded in a text known as the Persian Manifesto the suppression of the Cortes and the return to the old regime. Protected by force and by said manifesto, on May 4, 1814, Fernando VII suspended the constitution, dissolved the Cortes, repealed its legislative work and persecuted the liberals, who were imprisoned or had to go into exile. Thus, the Constitution of Cadiz was only in force between March 1812 and May 1814. It would be in force again between 1820 and 1823. On March 8, 1820, in Madrid, Fernando VII was forced to swear the Spanish Constitution of 1812 and to suppress the Spanish Inquisition. The Precursors The Precursors are those who promoted patriotic ideals by participating in the Mercurio Peruano the society of lovers of the country or laying the foundations of the Peruvian nation by holding political or institutional positions at the beginning of the republic. Contrary to what some believe, many sectors of the Peruvian population supported the emancipatory feat, whether by plotting, writing or directly fighting against Spanish rule. Definitely, we cannot forget the great revolts and conspiracies that men like José Lorenzo Silva, Francisco Antonio de Zella, the Angulo brothers and Mateo Pumacawa carried out at the risk of their own lives, thinking only of the country. The independence of Peru was promoted by the development of a political thought that proposed the emancipation of Spain. They believed that the crisis of the colonial order would only be overcome with the definitive break with Spain. Jose Aplito and Anu Y. Pavan, Erika, 1755-1833 Jose Aplito and Anu Y. Pavan was a precursor, humanist and defender of human health, he served as advisor to viceroys, general practitioner, editor of Mercurio Peruano, minister of finance of San Martin, deputy of the Constituent Congress and minister of Bolivar, 
among some other important positions. Among his works are observations on the climate of Lima, 1806, where he criticizes the hypothesis that the American climate diminished man's faculties. General Idea of Peru, another of his fundamental works, integrates the Inca past and the viceroyalty into a single discourse, recognizing all the historical testimony of the territory as Peruvian. Jose Bacuajano y Carrillo, Lima, 1751, Seville, 1817. Peruvian reformist, man of law and professor at the University of San Marcos. He was a collaborator of Mercurio Peruano. He is a reformist precursor of Peruvian emancipation because he believed that reforms were the best way to govern ourselves. Toribio Rodriguez de Mendoza, Chachapoyas, 1750, Lima, 1825. Priest and teacher of the important school of San Carlos. At the University of San Marcos he obtained bachelor's and doctoral degrees in theology. As a teacher, he transmitted his ideas, supported by Christian thought, educating the generation that affirmed independence. Juan Pablo Vizcardo y Guzman, Arequipa, 1748, London, 1798. Active and influential thinker of the time and main representative of the separatist current. After entering the Society of Jesus, he carried out his ecclesiastical studies in Cusco. With the expulsion of the Jesuits in 1767, he traveled to Europe, where he wrote his famous letter to the Spanish Americans in 1799, a text addressed to the Creoles in America in which he stated that the New World is our homeland and its history is ours. The Society of Lovers of the Country, 1790 it was a group made up of a series of young intellectuals with reformist and enlightened ideas. Their concerns were expressed in the Peruvian Mercurio. Heroes The heroes of independence are the first participants in what would be called the direct fight against the colonial system by belonging to the so-called patriotic side that includes infiltration and counterespionage tasks. José Gabriel Condor Canqui, Tupac Amaru II, 1738-1781 Jose Gabriel Condor Canqui was an indigenous leader, chief of Suramana, Tungasuka, and Pampamarca. He was responsible for organizing a great rebellion against the colonial system in 1780, a fact for which he went down in history. The largest in the entire era prior to national independence. Juan Santos Atahualpa, 1710-1756 Juan Santos Atahualpa was a Cusco indigenous leader. He is credited with having developed an important rebellion in Chanchameo against the colonial system with the aim of re-establishing Tawantinsuyo. Michaela Bastidas Puyukawa, 1745-1781 Michaela Bastidas was the wife of José Gabriel Condor Canqui, and a hero and martyr of the independence of Peru. Bastidas a few moments before the sentence was carried out, she energetically stated her independence conscience and declared, for the freedom of my people I have renounced everything. I will not see my children flourish. Francisco Antonio de Zella, 1768-1819 Francisco Antonio de Zella was a Creole administrator and military man. In 1811 he led a rebellion in Tacna against Viceroy Abascal. This action was considered the first libertarian cry in Peru and it is with this fact that the independence process began. Mateo Garcia Pumacawa, 1740-1815 Mateo Garcia Pumacawa was a chief from Chinchero who first participated in the royalist cause against Tupac Amaru II, however, he withdrew from this cause and later joined forces with other Creole and indigenous leaders to fight against Abascal. Maria Parado de Belido, 1777-1822 Maria Parado de Belido was a Quechua-speaking woman who worked in the postal section. Her role stood out above the others because she sent information to the Patriot side about the plans and mobilizations of the enemy army. José Olea Balandra, 1782-1823 José Olea Balandra was a fisherman from Carilla who contributed to the Patriot cause by carrying correspondence between the Lima Patriots and the officers besieged in Real Felipe. Juana de Dios Manrique de Luna, 1800-1877 
Juana de Dios Manrique de Luna was a lady from Lima who provided important economic support to the Peruvian patriots and allowed the good fate of secret communications. Topic 8. Liberating Current from the South, North. Southern Campaign. It began with the independence process of Argentina, Chile and Peru, led by the most excellent Argentine General Don José de San Martín and his army. Argentina was the first country to proclaim its independence and executed plans to liberate Chile and Peru from the Spanish government. From 1815 to 1822, after crossing the Andes Mountains, they achieved the independence of Chile and then organized their expedition to Peru from 1820, proclaiming the independence of Peru in 1821. He assumed the title of protector and ruled until September 1822. Independence of Argentina Argentina became independent from Spain in 1810 by overthrowing Viceroy Hidalgo de Cisneros on May 25, 1810. For some years they fought against the royalist resistance, winning several battles such as that of San Lorenzo in 1813, where Don José de San Martín stood out. From the Viceroyalty of Peru they also received royalist attacks. To confront them, they sent three armies between the years 1811, 1813 and 1815, but they were defeated by the forces of Viceroy Abascal. Independence of Chile It officially became independent from Spain on February 12, 1818, by the Argentine army under the command of General José de San Martín, after crossing the Andes Mountains. The same year, the Patriots won the Battle of Chacabuco, but were defeated at Cancha Rayada. Finally, on April 5, 1818, San Martín won the decisive Battle of Maipú. Shortly after, he prepared his expedition to Peru. Independence of Peru In 1820, the liberating expedition from Chile landed in Peru in Paracas and settled in Pisco under the command of General José de San Martín. Shortly afterward he moved to Waura. At the beginning of 1821, several northern cities joined the Patriots. Meanwhile, General José de la Serna staged a coup against Viceroy Pazuela on January 29, 1821, and negotiated the withdrawal of San Martín at the Panchaca Conference on July 2 of the same year. San Martín refused to withdraw and decided to lay siege to Lima. This caused La Serna and his troops to flee towards Cusco. San Martín entered Lima and proclaimed the independence of Peru on July 28, 1821, and under his protectorate until September 20, 1822 he withdrew without having expelled the royalist army from the southern mountains of Peru. First Congress and First Constitution For the first time, José de San Martín called on citizens on December 27, 1821, to freely elect a constituent congress through decree number 146, with the mission of establishing an adequate political constitution that would govern Peru, this device ordered from May 1, 1822 the installation of the congress, the date being delayed to April 27 due to the election regulations not having been drafted in time. On Friday, September 20, 1822, the congress was installed, consisting of 79 elected deputies and 38 substitutes for the provinces occupied by the royalists. There were prominent members of the clergy, the Forum, Letters and Sciences. Before this Congress, San Martín renounced the Protectorate and got ready to leave Peru. The Peruvian Congress of 1822 was the first democratically elected political institution in Peru. Its members, called deputies, were appointed in popular elections called by the liberator José de San Martín, who then exercised power as Protector of Peru. The main task of this assembly was to give the Republic of Peru its first political constitution, which was the Liberal Constitution of 1823. When San Martín retired, he handed over the executive power to three of its members, who formed a collegiate body called the Supreme Board. Government and whose head was General José de la March. After the proclamation of the independence of Peru in the former capital of the Viceroyalty of Peru, Lima, on July 28, 1821, General José de San Martín assumed political command military of the Free Departments of Peru, under the title of Protector, with Peruvian permission, according to the decree of August 3, 1821. On November 4, 
Congress agreed to thanksgiving to Lord Thomas Cochrane, Colombia, the Liberation Army, Chile and its Supreme Director, as well as expressing its recognition to the indigenous guerrillas and even the natives of the jungle, for their services in favor of independence. A great contribution of San Martin was giving the Peruvian state its first flag, its anthem, its currency, as well as its original administration and its first public institutions. But he still needed to give a political constitution and in the meantime, he imposed a provisional regulation, later replaced by a statute. Northern Campaign It was an independence campaign, led by the Venezuelan Simón Bolívar, between 1810 and 1826. It began with the fight for the freedom of the Viceroyalty of New Granada, Colombia, Venezuela, and Ecuador, and ended by achieving the independence of Peru and Bolivia. Independence of Gran Colombia It developed after a decade of bloody battles, where Simón Bolívar achieved the independence of Colombia by defeating the Spanish in the Battle of Boyaca on August 7, 1819. Venezuela achieved its independence by winning the Battle of Carabobo on August 24, 1819. Of 1821 and that of Ecuador by winning in Pachincha on May 24, 1822. Interview in Guayaquil in July 1822, Bolivar met with Don José de San Martín in Guayaquil. The result was the withdrawal of San Martín from Peru so that his liberation campaign could be completed by Bolivar. He arrived in Lima in September 1822 and was named dictator of Peru in February 1822. Thus, commanding the United Liberation Army, he defeated the Spanish in the Battle of Junín on August 6, 1824, and his lieutenant Antonio José de Sucre he defeated them in the decisive Battle of Ayacucho on December 9, 1824. Independence of Bolivia Sucre headed to Upper Peru, territory that currently belongs to Bolivia, to defeat the Spanish Antonio Olanita, but upon arriving he learned that he had been killed by his own soldiers. He then convened the Congress of Chuquisaca where on August 6, 1825 the birth of the Republic of Bolivia was decided. Bolivarian Project, Bolivar tried to unite Gran Colombia, Peru and Bolivia to turn them into the Confederation of the Andes. However, he could not overcome the opposition of local nationalists and in 1830 pulmonary consumption worsened, leading to his death. First Militarism and Caudalism After the wars for independence, the nascent Peruvian state was calamitous. The economy was in clear decline as a result of so many years of military campaign. The productive apparatus was paralyzed as a result of the devastating military incursions, which caused a serious paralysis in our agriculture, mining and commerce. The economic crisis had a direct impact on Peruvian society, with the popular sectors, Indians, mestizos, blacks, being the ones who received the hardest impact. A nascent Republican state, formally constituted under the bourgeois demoliberal ideological schemes of the American and French Revolution, must have brought with it a substantial change in the class structures of social differentiation that prevailed during colonialism. Changes that should have manifested themselves in a substantive improvement in the living conditions of the Indian, the black and the excluded sectors, but it was the opposite, the differences worsened and the state became a coercive instrument at the service of the oligarchic leaders, who, from power, took advantage of it to the detriment of the masses. With respect to the legal system that was to serve as the basis for the functioning of the nascent state, it should be noted that the liberal constitution of 1823 was the legal instrument that guaranteed the initial development of our newly founded republic. The territorial determination of the nascent republican states in Latin America was solved by virtue of the application of two legal principles. 1. The UTI Posadidas of 1810, this principle consisted that each country would have the right to territorial sovereignty, according to the territory it had possessed as colonial territory around 1810. 2. The free determination of peoples, this second legal principle indicated that peoples, in application of the principles of popular sovereignty, could spontaneously and freely decide which nation they belonged to. According to this, if a town by UTI Posadetis belonged to one country, but decided by free determination to move to another, then the first principle was void and the town began to belong to the other country. 
An example of this is the case of Jane, which by UTI Pasadetas legitimately belonged to La Gran Colombia, but upon deciding by free determination to belong to Peru, it legitimately became part of our sovereignty, even electing its representatives for our Constituent Congress of 1822. The leadership of the first years of the Republic emerged as a consequence of the lack of an organic civil class, the lack of an entrepreneurial bourgeoisie with precise and defined political objectives. The prestige obtained by the Caudillos of Independence, known as the Mariscals of Ayacucha, after the Wars for Independence, concluded. The inability of the civilian Creoles to guarantee the stability and internal and external order of the incipient republic. The need to impose the principle of authority in the face of the danger that the Montaneros or Indian guerrillas represented for the interests of the dominant classes. With the wars for independence concluded and the danger that Spain represented removed, the task remained of consolidating the nascent Peruvian state. Once our independence was sealed with the signing of the capitulation of Ayacucho in December 1824, Bolivar prolonged his dictatorial powers in our country, aspiring to establish his long-awaited dictatorship for life, a fact that was demonstrated when, against all sense of rationality, he entrusted Marshal Sucre with the creation of a new republic, on territories that had historically been Peruvian, that is, Upper Peru. Thus, in 1825 Sucre created the Republic of Bolivia and drafted the Lifetime Constitution as a legal instrument to perpetuate itself in power. It is approved in Peru, although days later it is repealed, given the tenacious political opposition of the liberal nationalist sectors that pressure Bolivar to leave command and leave the country. It is in this context that, in June 1826, Bolivar's authoritarian and lifelong claims reached their maximum expression, calling the Congress of Panama, with the purpose of establishing a Hispano-American confederation, that is, the meeting of all the nascent Spanish-American republics from Mississippi to Cape Horn, obviously, under Bolivarian hegemony. This project fails due to the misgivings of the local bourgeoisies of each of the aforementioned nations, reluctant to agree to submit to the Venezuelan dictator. In a last attempt to achieve his federative desires, Bolivar proposed the creation of the Federation of the Andes, consisting of the meeting of the states he liberated, at that time represented by Greater Colombia, Peru and the recently founded Bolivia. This federalist trial was also not successful due to the opposition reactions of each of those countries. Seeing that his authoritarian plans were frustrated and cornered by the fierce liberal opposition in Peru, he chose to leave the country in September 1826, setting sail from Calao bound for La Gran Colombia, leaving General Andresti in charge of the government council. Santa Cruz, a character who also had authoritarian ambitions and pretensions. Santa Cruz calls a constituent congress and elections for 1827, presenting his candidacy against that of his opponent, General José de la March. The Congress of the Republic, mostly liberal, and therefore, a political adversary of Santa Cruz, handed over power to General José de la Mar, given that he did not represent any threat to their interests, but on the contrary, would be a docile instrument for achieving its objectives. In this way, the first militarism was established in Peru, a period of caudalismo marked by instability, the petty interest of the dominant sectors and lost opportunities to the detriment of Peru. Governments of the First Militarism in the period 1827-1845 1. José de L.A. Mar, 1827-1829 Main Facts He represented the weak executive branch, congressional predominance. He promulgated the Liberal Constitution of 1828, he implemented the Bicameral Congress. He defeated the rebellion of the Iquichanos, rebels against taxes in Huanta, Ayacucho. In a conflict with La Gran Colombia, the presence of the Colombian army in Bolivia was extremely dangerous for Peru, since Peru would find itself between two war fronts. After Gamara invades Bolivia, in July 1828 Sucre is forced to sign the Treaty of Paquiza by which he renounces the government. This will be the trigger for Bolivar to declare war on us. War with Great Colombia, 1828-1829 Causes Bolivar's Hegemonic Ambitions Bolivarian Territorial Claims over Tums, Jane and Menas Gamara's Intervention in Bolivia Stages 
Maritime, Peruvian success led by English Admiral Jorge Martín Guise. The Peruvians win the battles at Malpilo and Cruces, blocking the Colombian coast and occupying Guayaquil. Immolation of Guise. Land, Peruvian defeats in the battles of San José de Saraguro on February 13, 1829, and Portet de Tarqui on February 27, 1829. La Mar negotiated with Sucre, both signing the Gurn Convention on February 28, 1829. In this agreement was agreed, the Peruvian deoccupation of Guayaquil and all Colombian territory, the payment by Peru of compensation to Colombia, and a cessation of hostilities. Coup d'état against the sea. After ignoring this agreement, classifying it as a traitor and harmful to the interests of Peru, Antonio Gutierrez de la Fuente led a coup d'état in Lima against Manuel Salazar y Bacuajano, vice president of La March. Simultaneously in Pura Gamara captured La Mar and deported to Costa Rica. End of the war. The war culminates after Gamara signs the Armistice of Pura and the definitive peace treaty signed in Guayaquil on September 21, 1829, called Laria G. Will. By this treaty, Colombia renounced its claims over the Peruvian provinces of Tums, Jane and Maynas, while Peru forever renounced its legitimate rights over the coastal port of Guayaquil. Augustin Gamara, 1829-1833 General Data Rank, Grand Marshal of Peru and Generalissimo of the Sea and Land Forces Government Period, December 19, 1829 to December 19, 1833 he won the presidential elections of 1829, Peru's first popular elections. He was the first president of Peru to conclude his presidential term. Style of government, he wanted to strengthen the state through an authoritarian style until 1833, with the support of his wife Francisca Zubiaga, La Mariscala. Most important fact of his government, the important fact of Augustin Gamara's government was the Treaty of Peace and Friendship, celebrated in Guayaquil on September 22, 1829, by which the dispute with Colombia that caused the war was settled. In 1831, tensions arose with Bolivia, with the treaties of Arequipa and Tequina being signed, which avoided a war with the highland country. Main Works Creation of the Department of Amazonas Creation of the Lima Maternity Hospital, Creation of the National Guard, Creation of the Port of Cerro Azul, Canet, and the creation of the General Directorate of Customs. Luis José de Orbigoso, 1833-1836 Main Facts and Works He created the Public Beneficence of Lima. Liberal Constitution of 1834 Guarantee Citizen Liberties he suffers the Gamarista coup d'état led by Pedro Bermudez, which takes Lima, but upon seeing himself rejected by the people, he chooses to leave the capital and take refuge in the Sierra. It is there where a bloody civil war will occur, resulting in a division of the army between the two leaders. General Domingo Nieto, Orbigoso's ally, will be defeated by the Gamarista forces in the Battle of Cangalo, while the forecasts of General Echenique, who was an ally of Bermudez, allowed the rebel forces to prevail over President Orbigoso's army. It is at that moment when Echenique's forces choose to surrender to Orbigoso and betray Bermudez, letting him escape and negotiating with Orbigoso the delivery of all his troops under his orders. Thus, according to Orbigoso's provisions, both armies met on the plain of Macuingueo, a place where instead of facing each other, both armies embraced each other in a fraternal and generous embrace. Felipe Santiago Salaveri. Coup d'eta by General Felipe Santiago Salaveri from the castles of Calao, real Felipe, who proclaims himself supreme head of the republic, causing the fall of the Orbigasista regime. Salaveri came to power when he was barely 29 years old, and is therefore considered the youngest president of the republic to date. Faced with this situation, the defenestrated president, who at that time was in Arequipa, concluded an alliance with Marshal Santa Cruz, President of Bolivia, to receive from him the necessary military support to defeat Salaveri and regain power. The condition that Santa Cruz sets is the establishment of the Peru-Bolivian Confederation. Orbigoso accepts and the Bolivian army enters Peru with the objective of defeating Salaveri's forces and establishing the Confederation. Under these circumstances, 
the alliance between Salaveri and former President Agustin Gamara occurred. The Peru Bolivia Confederation, 1836 to 1839. Once Salaveri was eliminated and Gamara was banished, Santa Cruz, with the consent of Orbigoso, proceeded to establish the Peru Bolivia Confederation. Santa Cruz's plan was to divide Peru into two states, North Peruvian State and South Peruvian State, which together with Bolivia would give rise to the Confederation. The creation of these would be carried out after constitutive assemblies were held, where, in addition to formally establishing the North and South Peruvian states, they would elect their representatives for a Congress of Plenipotentiaries where the organizational guidelines of the Confederation would be outlined. The assemblies held were Sequani Assembly, South Peruvian State. Wara Assembly, North Peruvian State. Tapacari Assembly, Bolivian State. Thus, on October 28, 1836, the Peru-Bolivia Confederation was formally established. Organization The organizational structure of the confederations was carried out on May 1, 1837 at the Congress of Tacna. The legal basis of the confederation was the Act of Tacna, which named Santa Cruz Supreme Protector of the Confederation for a government period of 10 years, indefinitely renewable. The protector would elect the presidents of each state, in addition to electing the senators for the General Congress and the magistrates of the Supreme Courts. As for the legislative branch, this would be bicameral. In addition, he established a judicial branch, with Supreme Courts in each of the Confederate states. Works of Santa Cruz Change municipalities for tax unions Promulgates a Napoleonic-type civil code he declares Paita, Calao, Arica and Cobija free ports, bringing with him the misgivings of Guayaquil and Valparaiso. War against the Confederacy Chilean President Joaquin Prieto, influenced by his Minister of the Interior Diego Portales, declared war on the Confederation on December 26, 1836, taking as a pretext the alleged support of the Confederate government for Ramon Freire, former Chilean president who had tried to overthrow Prieto. By coup d'état. Argentina, encouraged by Chile, declared war on the Confederation on May 19, 1837. With the purpose of dissolving the Confederation, the Chileans would carry out two restorative expeditions, which were 1. First Restoration Expedition, 1837. Directed by Blanco and Calada, and supported by the Peruvian military, Gutierrez de la Fuente, Castilla, Vivanco. He landed in Arequipa and was defeated by Santa Cruz in the Battle of Pacarpata, signing the treaty of the same name in November 1837. 2. Second Restoration Expedition, 1838-1839 Directed by Manuel Bolnas and the traitorous collaborationism of the following Peruvians, Gamara, Castilla, La Fuente, and Vidal. He landed in Ancon and then the following battles would take place. Yungay, January 20, 1839. Victory of Castilla over Santa Cruz. The Peru-Bolivia Confederation is dissolved. The Conservative Restoration. Second Government of Augustin Gamara, 1839-1841. Government imposed by the Chileans after the Confederation was dissolved. Main Facts and Works. Holding a constituent congress in Huancaya, where the Conservative Constitution of 1839 will be promulgated. Foundation of Guadalupe School. Foundation of the newspaper El Comercio. Beginning of steam navigation and the discovery of the island's guano. A last attempt would be made to unite Peru and Bolivia. Gamara invades Bolivia, but is defeated by the Bolivians in the Battle of Ngavi, where he dies. Mr. Manuel Menendez takes power in his capacity as president of the Council of State. The Bolivians invade Peru and try to take Puno, Macagua, Tacna, Arica and Tarapaca from us. The guerrilla groups intervene heroically, neutralizing the Bolivian attack. With the mediation of the Chileans, the Treaty of Puno was signed in June 1842, which ended the war with Bolivia. The Bolivians vacate Peruvian territory but are freed from their debt to Peru. Military Anarchy, 1842-1844 to 
Stage of Chaos and Political and Social Upheaval in Peru. It was a difficult stage in which no government was consolidated. At this time, the following facts stand out. November 1841, Manuel Menendez is recognized as president of Peru upon the death of Gamara. August 1842, Juan Crisostomo Torico overthrows Menendez by coup d'etat. October 1842, Francisco Vidal defeats Torico in the Battle of Agua Santa in Ica. He assumes supreme command from October 1842 to February 1843. From Arequipa, Manuel Ignacio de Vivanco revolts against Vidal. Faced with this fact, Vidal resigns from power, with Justo Figueroa assuming command. February to April 1843, Provisional Government of Mr. Justo Figueroa. Vivanco overthrows Figueroa and assumes supreme command from April 1843 to July 1844. He establishes an ultra conservative and aristocratic regime called Directorio, naming himself Supreme Director. June 1844, Uprising of Ramon Castilla in Arequipa. When Vivanco was heading to Arequipa to confront Castilla, on June 17, 1844, he was the victim of a coup d'etat by his vice president Domingo Elias. He governs for one week, from June 17 to 24, hence the name of the Magna Week regime. Meanwhile, on June 22, 1844, Castilla defeated Vivanco in the Battle of Carmen Alto in Arequipa. Faced with these facts, Elias hands over power to Justo Figueroa. Pressured by Castilla, Figueroa handed over power to Manuel Menendez in October 1844, being recognized by Ramon Castilla. Menendez will govern until April 1845, the year in which elections will be called. And General Ramon Castilla will be elected president of the republic, beginning the period of fallacious prosperity. Political projects of San Martin and Bolivar. Political projects of San Martin. The Congress gave the final blow on November 22 to the monarchical illusion of San Martin. It disavowed the commission of Juan Garcia del Rio and Diego Peroshin, who had been sent to Europe to look for a king for Peru, and on December 22 that year. The same Congress established the basis of the political constitution. Among the many reforms introduced, the abolition of the Negro trade stands out. The first step in the work of the Constituent Assembly was the preparation of the basis of the political constitution at the hands of a congressional commission made up of deputies Justo Figueroa, Francisco Xavier de Luna Pizarro, Jose Joaquin de Olmedo, Manuel Perez of Tudela, and Hippolito Anaño. These bases were promulgated by the Government Board on December 17, 1822. They consisted of 24 articles, which broadly stated that all the provinces of Peru, reunited in a single body, formed the Peruvian nation, which from then on would be called the Peruvian Republic. Likewise, it established that sovereignty resided in the nation, being independent of the Spanish monarchy and any other type of foreign domination. His religion would be Catholic, to the exclusion of any other, and is for. The national power it would be divided into three powers: the legislative, the executive, and the judicial. Political project of Simón Bolívar. He proposed an alternative political organization to overcome the territorial fragmentation of the former Spanish colonies. The Venezuelans' proposal consisted of the creation of a political unit that would group together all the territories that had been part of the Spanish Empire in America. In the words of Bolivar, it is a funny idea to try to form the entire New World into a single nation with a single bond that links its parts to each other and to the whole. Since they have an origin, a language, customs, and a religion, America should have a single government that would confederate the following states that are to be formed. The most serious attempt to achieve this unity was given by the Congress that Bolivar convened in Panama in 1824. Delegates from Greater Colombia. Peru, Mexico, and Central America met there. Despite good intentions, no concrete progress was made towards continental unity. Despite this failure, Bolivar continued with the project of the Great Colombia, a federation that since 1822 brought together the current Ecuador, Colombia, Venezuela, and Panama. Bolivar intended to consolidate the Great Colombia so that it would be the basis for the construction of a great homeland that would include all Americans. 
However, this project failed, due to the role played by several military leaders who had gained power and prestige in different regions of Greater Colombia during the Wars of Independence. These local leaders took up arms against the central government and against the authority of Bolivar, a situation that ended with the separation of Ecuador, which was led by Juan José Flores, and the secession of Venezuela, which was led by José Antonio Pérez. After the fragmentation of Great Colombia in 1829, Bolívar, alone and disillusioned, took refuge in the country house of a friend of his, where he died in 1830. Objective of the Peru-Bolivia Confederation The objective of forming a state that would unite both countries in the search for the recovery of the commercial links that had articulated the region since pre-Hispanic times. In this way, greater military, economic and political strength would be obtained, a fact that would of course alter the well-being of the other neighboring countries, especially, Argentina and Chile. Let us remember that the commercial circuit between southern Peru and Bolivia was dissolved with the annexation of Upper Peru to the Viceroyalty of the Rio de la Plata between the years 1776-1814, and, later, with the creation of the Republic of Bolivia, in 1825. In 1833 Agustin de Mara was president of Peru. After a series of conflicts with Congress, the National Convention was created. This body appointed Luis José de Orbigoso as the new president. However, de Mara rebelled and entered into a struggle for power. De Mara was exiled to Bolivia, from there he went to Ecuador and then to Chile. On January 22, 1835, in Calao, the military leader Felipe Santiago Salaberry took place from 1806 to 1836, where he rebelled against President Luis José de Orbegoso and proclaimed himself supreme head of the republic. It was then that in Arequipa, Orbegoso began talks with Bolivian President Andrés Santa Cruz to protect his authority. Alliance with Bolivia Luis José Orbigoso allied himself with his Bolivian counterpart in June 1835. Andrés de Santa Cruz sent nearly 2,000 soldiers to fight Salaveri, who was in Arequipa. Both armies faced each other three times. It would be in the Battle of Socobea, where Salaveri was definitively defeated, on February 7, 1836. Taken prisoner, shortly after, he was shot on February 18, 1836. However, since the creation of the confederation between Peru and Bolivia was only formalized in 1837, the existence of the confederation is considered, de facto, from the day of victory in the Battle of Socobea, by Santa Cruz. About Felipe Santiago Salaveri Establishment of the Confederation It was structured into three independent states. The northern Peruvian state, made up of the departments of La Libertad, Amazonas, Huelas, Junín, and Lima. Capital, the city of Lima. Presidents, Luis José Orbegoso y Moncada, and José de la Riva Aguero. The southern Peruvian state, made up of Ayacucho, Arequipa, Cusco, and Puno. Capital, constitutionally it was the city of Tacna, although de facto it was Cusco. President, Ramón Herrera y Rodadu, and Juan Pio de Tristan y Moscoso. The Bolivian state, it included the entire territory of this country. It was divided into the departments of Cachabamba, Chuquisaca, La Paz, Potosi, and Santa Cruz. Capital, La Paz, Sucre. President, Mariano Enrique Calvo Cuellar, sole president. The confederation, in its entirety, remained under the supreme leadership of General Santa Cruz. However, each state had an independent ruler. End of Confederation From the beginning of the alliance between Peru and Bolivia, the governments of Chile and Argentina declared themselves in disagreement with the pact, since this would mean a great political, economic and military disadvantage for them. The Chilean government sent its troops, on a first expedition, for a frontal fight with the Confederate army. They were defeated in the town of Pacarpata, Arequipa, in November 1837. Shortly after, the Chileans organized a second expedition, in which the former Peruvian president Agustin Gamara participated between 1785 to 1841. On January 20, 1839, 
they defeated to Santa Cruz in the Battle of Yungay and Ancash, thereby ending the existence of the Confederation, which lasted approximately three years. Gamara assumed power, continuing a time of anarchy in our country, which would only end with the government of Ramon Castilla, in 1844. Topic 9. Guana Exploitation to National Reconstruction. The Guano and Saltpeter War. Chile and English Imperialism Against Peru and Bolivia, 1879-1883 The Guano and Saltpeter War was a financial war by English capitalism in favor of Chile so that Peru would lose its nitrate reserves and the entire national development project would be annulled. The civilist project of Manuel Pardo y Laval contemplated the expansion of a productive apparatus based on agro-export and mining. To make this project a reality, Control of the Tarapaca saltpeter by the Peruvian state was proposed, coming into conflict with Anglo-Chilean interests such as the Gibbs who had already invested in the Tarapaca saltpeter mines. Background Chile's Participation in the Separation of the Peruvian-Bolivian Confederation Chilean-Bolivian Territorial Conflict Caused by the Discovery of Guano and Saltpeter in Atacama, Antofagasta, Bolivia Manuel Bulnas, Chilean president, fixed the Chile-Bolivia border up to the 23rd parallel. In 1886 Mariano Melgarejo, Chilean-Bolivian president, through a treaty with Chile fixed the Chile-Bolivia border up to the 24th parallel and allowed the Chileans to continue exploiting the deposits up to the 23rd parallel as long as the profits go half and half. In 1871, the Bolivian Senate created a customs tax for Antofagasta that Chile agreed to pay as long as it did not increase in 25 years. In 1873 the secret treaty of defensive alliance was signed between Peru and Bolivia. In 1878, the Bolivian president Hilarion Daza raised the customs tax by 10 cents, Chile did not accept and Bolivia took over the facilities of the Compañía Anónima de Saladers de Antofagasta, before which Chile blocked the port of Antofagasta. Peru offers itself as a mediator and sends the Laval mission, failing. Fundamental Causes The crisis of the Chilean economy, which he wanted to remedy by taking over the nitrate mines of Antofagasta and Tarapaca. The expansionist project of the Chilean oligarchy, through which they found the only way out of their economic difficulties. The veracity of English capitalism for Guano and Saltpeter, who financed and used the Chileans to launch them against Peru and Bolivia. The measures adopted by the governments of Bolivia and Peru that affected the nitrate companies of Antofagasta and Tarapaca that the English had invested in them. Pretexts For Bolivia, in 1878, Bolivian President Hilarion Daza decided to levy a tax of 10 cents on each quintal of saltpeter exported from Atacama. The Chilean government complained and the Chilean nitrate companies refused to pay. Daza expropriated the nitrate mines. In response, Chile broke its diplomatic relations with Bolivia and on March 14, 1879, Colonel Sotomayor militarily occupied the Atacama region, declaring that they claimed for Chile the territory south of the 23rd parallel. Bolivia was trapped in the Andes. For Peru, the Peruvian José Antonio de Laval was sent as an arbitrator so that Chile and Bolivia could reach a peaceful agreement. On the way he only learned about the secret treaty of 1873. Laval was received with hostility in Chile. His mediation failed, because during the negotiations, Bolivian President Daza declared war on Chile on March 1, 1879. The Chilean government, headed by Enibol Pinto, demanded neutrality from Peru. When Chile refused, it declared war on Peru on April 5, 1879. Situation of the belligerent countries The Republic of Chile Poor and small, in debt but armed. Relatively orderly country Society of whites and mestizos with significant European immigration, a certain economic development dependent on English capitalism and some cultural level. Large and respectable army for discipline and equipment. Modern and uniform weapons of Prussian manufacture, modern, numerous navy, in which the battleships Cochrane and Blanco and Colada stood out, which tripled the power of the Wasker. Republic of Bolivia. Backward, cloistered, convulsed and disarmed. 
Majority indigenous population, marginalized, exploited and ignorant. Reduced army with illiterate troops almost lacking military training. Antiquated and varied weaponry. No navy. The Peruvian Republic. Indebted with outdated weapons that his crisis prevented from being renewed. Ruled by oligarchs and improvident leaders. Social abyss between the Creole aristocracy and the exploited, marginalized and ignorant indigenous population. Reduced army, half illiterate Indians with little military training, undisciplined commanders. Old fashioned navy. Ramon Castilla y Marquesadu. Marshal Ramon Castilla was born in Tarapaca on August 31, 1797. His parents were Pedro de Castilla and Juana Marquesadu. In his youth, he joined the Royalist Army and fought in Chile against the independence forces. In 1820, he decided to join the Patriots, and in 1824, he participated in the Battle of Ayacucho with the United Liberation Army. Ramon Castilla became constitutional president of Peru from 1845 to 1851, during which he paid the external and internal debt. There was a time of economic prosperity around the extraction of guano from the island. In 1849, the immigration of Chinese coolies to our country took place. One of his most important works was the construction of the first railway in Peru and the second in South America. In his second government, between the years of 1855 to 1862, he put an end to the unfair tribute that Indians paid for living on their own land and abolished slavery. He also inaugurated the drinking water service in Lima, as well as the establishment of the telegraph service in Lima and Calao. He died on May 30, 1867, when he was trying to return to Peru in the Tilavish Desert. His remains rest in the crypt of the heroes of the Presbytero Maestro Cemetery Museum. He reorganized the postal system, giving it security and guarantee. Likewise, he implemented the first mechanical loom in the country, which began the first manufacture of cotton fabrics. He created factories for spark plugs, sulfuric acid and paper. The latter was installed by the owners of the newspaper El Comercio in the city of Lima. He built numerous churches, hospitals, markets, customs, prefectures, roads and bridges throughout the Republic of Peru. He had an Americanist policy at the international level inspired by a deep feeling of unity and solidarity between the countries of the continent. The Dreyfus Contract Commercial agreements signed in Paris on July 5, 1869 between the representatives of the Peruvian state and the House of Dreyfus and Brothers, a company whose owner was Auguste Dreyfus. Later, some improvements and extensions were made. Through this contract, the House of Dreyfus and Hermanos it committed to acquiring 2 million tons of island guano from the Peruvian state, valued at 73 million sols, which it had to pay at a rate of 700,000 sols per month. At the same time, it committed to giving the state an advance of 2 million sols, and also committed to covering the service of the Peruvian external debt, which amounted to 5 million sols annually. It was approved by the government on August 17, 1869, in the midst of great controversy that divided public opinion. At that time, Colonel José Belta was ruling in Peru and Nicolás de Piera de Elena, who was the architect of the contract, was Minister of Finance. The consignees or national guano businessmen accused the government of dispossession and attempted to supplant the House of Dreyfus through judicial means. The Supreme Court ruled in favor of the consignees, but the Congress of the Republic finally settled the controversy, approving and executing the contract on November 11, 1870. However, Dreyfus did not fully comply with all the clauses of the contract and was accused of manipulating the Peruvian state. The contract, after having successive modifications, was finally terminated in 1876. Railway Policy The purpose of President José Belta was that through the railways the long-awaited national unity would be achieved, with this device he would unite both central places and the most remote ones. Furthermore, exploit the country's wealth. For this purpose, President Belta hired the services of the famous businessman Henry Meggs, Stuart Sienki Pizarro, who in turn hired the Polish engineer Ernesto Malinowski, architect of the Lima-La Central Andean Railway. 
With the passage of time and the invention of artificial railways and the rise of saltpeter, the price of guano dropped considerably, leaving us with a high debt that caused Peru to enter into crisis. The railways intensified the enclave economy in the regions where the railway lines were established because the journey from the estates to the sea for export was assured. The lines were built following a horizontal pattern and not a vertical one, the horizontal pattern did not generate markets, it only intensified the exploitation of resources. If the vertical direction had been followed, internal markets would have been formed that would have generated a certain internal production. Emergence of the Civilist Project Founded on April 24, 1871 by 193 citizens gathered at the home of José Antonio García y García in order to support the presidential candidacy of the former mayor of Lima, Manuel Pardo y Laval. Initially it adopted the name Electoral Independence Society. It was a group of wealthy merchants, Juano consignees, industrialists and landowners, representatives of the nascent national bourgeoisie. Not content with holding economic power, they also aspired to control political power. They were also joined by numerous intellectuals, such as lawyers from the University of San Marcos and journalists from El Comercio and El Nacional. For them, militarism was the curse that had been postponing the rise of Peru as a nation, he was accused of absolutism, of deferring to the social classes from managing politics and of being the spur to revolutions or seditions. This being so, they maintained that it was not the popular will or public opinion that made the president make decisions. There was enthusiastic support in Lima and the provinces at the possibility of a civilian as ruler. Hence the name Civil Party was born, organized that same year for the electoral boards. The following points were contemplated in the civil program. Support for popular education, so that each citizen could carry out a normal exercise of their rights. The promotion of technical education, to train personnel suitable for the exploitation of the country's natural resources, as well as the improvement of public administration. The balance of the national budget, to counteract the failed loan policy of the previous government. The nationalization of saltpeter. The professionalization and democratization of the armed forces. Among other measures, the implementation of compulsory military service was contemplated. At the international level, the establishment of alliances. The first elected candidate of the civil party was Manuel Pardo y Laval, who governed from August 2, 1872 to August 2, 1876. At the international level, he signed the Treaty of Defensive Alliance with Bolivia in 1873, which would later serve as an argument for Chile to unleash the Pacific War. To make matters worse, he neglected national defense, cancelling the construction of two armored ships, while Chile armed itself dangerously, surpassing Peru's war power. For the 1876 elections, in which Pardo's successor was to be chosen, the civil party prepared to launch José Simeon Tejeda as its presidential candidate, but he died shortly before the campaign began. The civilistas, due to their dissensions, did not agree on naming a candidate, and it was then that the idea arose of supporting General Mariano Ignacio Prado, given his prestige as a public man not only at the national but also continental level, for being the winner of the war with Spain in 1866. His candidacy was made official on January 31, 1875. To confront Prado, the candidacy of Rear Admiral Lazardo Montero arose, who was elected in a personal capacity since he did not have the support of any party. After the elections were held without major violence, Prado was elected by an overwhelming majority. In 1877 the civil party achieved an appreciable majority in the renewal of Congress. In 1878, it suffered a severe blow with the assassination of its leader Manuel Pardo y Laval. In any case, he maintained his popularity and was already preparing, with good omens, for the elections of 1880, when the War of the Pacific broke out in 1879, which disrupted the entire local political scene. During the war crisis, the civil party opposed the dictatorship of Nicolas de Pierrela, supported the government of Francisco Garcia Calderon in 1881, and supported the pronouncement of General Miguel Iglesias and the peace efforts he made, once consolidated in the can. After the Pacific War, 
the party played a key role in national reconstruction. Most of its members were still from the Lima elite. Together with the Democratic Party of Nicolas de Pierrela, his political rival, he opposed the predominant militarism and politics, militarism represented by General Andres A. Cáceres, who after governing from 1886 to 1890, passed the baton to one of his faithful supporters, Colonel Remigio Morales Bermudez, elected in elections with notable official support. Civic rally in the main square of Lima, in 1895, celebrating the triumph of the Civic Democratic Coalition over Cáceres. In 1893 the party joined the parliamentary circle of former Cacerista Mariano Nicolas Valcarcel, forming the civic union that sought to support his presidential candidacy. However, the following year, President Remigio Morales Bermudez died suddenly and second vice president, Justiniano Borgono, assumed the interim presidency, calling elections in which Andres A. Cáceres was controversially elected. On the eve of Morales Bermudez's death, the Civic Union had joined the Democratic Party of the exiled Nicolas de Pierrela, who led the so-called National Coalition against President Cáceres. In 1895 Cáceres was deposed after a civil war and that year elections were called in which Pierrela was elected with the support of the National Coalition. Pacific War at the beginning of the 1840s, large accumulations of guano and saltpeter were discovered in Tarapaca and Antofagasta, fertilizers that were beginning to be highly valued on the market. World Incidents and claims between Bolivia and Chile followed one another in the following years, while the diplomats of both countries argued respectively about the rights they had in the region, exhibiting colonial documents on the jurisdiction of the Audiencia de Charcas or the Captaincy General of Chile. Peru felt its supremacy on the Pacific coast was threatened and signed a secret treaty on February 6, 1873, whose intentions were to protect the integrity and sovereignty of the signatory countries. Argentina was invited to sign the pact, its government agreed and requested parliamentary approval. Indeed, the Chamber of Deputies in Buenos Aires approved the adhesion to the pact and added an item of 6 million pesos to the budget for the war. But Bolivia and Argentina disputed the Tarija area and did not reach an agreement. Argentina then proposed to Peru a Peru-Argentina treaty, without Bolivia, but Peru rejected the offer. Combat of Iquique April 21, 1879 The Huascar and Independence Monitor left Calao on May 16 heading south, carrying President General Prado. Upon arriving in Arica they learned that Iquique was blocked by the Corvette Esmeralda and the gunboat Covadonga, the rest of the Chilean squadron was sailing towards Calao to hunt down the only Peruvian armored vehicles. Vrau decided to confront them in the bay. While the Huascar faced the Esmeralda, Covadonga took the opportunity to flee, Guillermo Moore, commander of the Independencia, pursued the fugitive gunboat. The combat between Huascar and the Esmeralda was tough, after the cannon shots Grau decided to use the spur, the execution of which was fatal for the Chilean corvette, a few moments after the collision it began to shipwreck, as its captain Arturo Pratt was lost. He made the decision to approach his adversary, gun in hand, he confronted Lt. Segundo Velarde, whom he eliminated, becoming the first Peruvian hero of the naval campaign. Almost at the same time, the Peruvian sailor Mariano Portales fired an accurate shot at Pratt's forehead, who died instantly. With this episode, the combat ended. Commander Grau ordered his officers to save the castaways of the Esmeralda. When the Chileans found themselves on the deck of the Huascar, they shouted, Long live, generous Peru! Meanwhile, independence pursued the Covadonga, which stuck to the coast, taking advantage of its slightest draft. This tactic forced the Peruvian frigate to stay at a certain distance, trying to hunt it down with the only cannon it had. Unfortunately, this cannon soon broke down so Moore tried to spur his rival. When he was just 200 meters away he was surprised by a rock that did not appear on the navigation charts. Our ship was soon filling with water. Carlos Condal, captain of the Covadonga, upon realizing what had happened, returned to finish sinking it and machine-gunning its castaways who were struggling to save themselves. From the shore, Colonel Casares and his troops tried to help those of the independents who were fighting to reach the coast. After the Huascar saved 40 Chileans, he headed south in pursuit of the Covadonga, 
which fled when it saw the presence of the Wasker. Grau ordered to collect the survivors, remove the cannons and burn the frigate so that the enemy would not take advantage of anything. In Iquique, Peru lost the war. An overwhelming naval advantage remained in favor of Chile. Commander Moore was put on trial for having lost independence and suffered demotion as punishment. He died as a hero in defense of Arica. The Wasker Bullfights After the Battle of Iquique, Wasker continued to be very active, which gave him prestige and later filled with glory. Since then, Wasker became the terror of Chileans, to the point of generating serious political tensions within the government of any bull pinto. On May 24, it sailed south of Iquique, sinking the schooner recovered. Upon reaching Megalones, it set fire to the schooner Clorinda, destroying other vessels and port facilities. On May 26, it arrived in Antofagasta where it shelled the land defenses and exchanged shots with the Covadonga, then cut the submarine cable that communicated with Valparaiso. The next day she captured the schooner Coquita and the boat Emilia, arriving in Arica with her prey. As he continued his raids, he was pursued for ten days by the armored Cochrane and the Magallanes. He arrived in Calau in order to carry out various repairs on the ship, but received orders from the war director, Aurelio Garcia y Garcia, to return to the south to capture smaller ships. On July 23, the Wasker and the Union captured the Rimac artillery transport that was taking the Yungay Carabinero squadron to Antofagasta, with its full complement of horses and implements. The capture of the Rimac caused great joy in Peru, but in Chile there were altercations in the Senate, violence, popular demonstrations against the leaders of the war, which brought the resignation of Admiral Williams Ribolito, there was even talk of the resignation of President Enibol I. Paint. Combat of Antofagasta, August 28, 1879 When Wasker visited Antofagasta on August 25, he found Magallanes, Abado and Limari. Given their passivity, he withdrew without any combat taking place. She continued sailing south. Upon returning to Antofagasta on the 28th she was attacked by Magallanes and Abado. On that occasion, war torpedoes were used for the first time. The Wasker fired a lay torpedo at the Abado, but because the mechanism was broken it was not launched correctly and she returned against the Wasker. If it had touched it, the fate of the Wasker would have been fatal, but one of her officers, Lt. Furman Diaz Canseco, seeing the danger, threw himself into the sea and managed to divert the course of the torpedo. After this incident, the Wasker shelled the Abado, causing serious damage. The combat lasted three hours, at the end of which Grau headed his ship north. At the end of the combat, Grau headed his ship north, making stops in Medjolones, Cobija, Tocapilla, and Iquique. Upon arriving in Arica he was promoted to rear admiral. The Chilean military high command was very concerned about the raids of the Wasker and the skill demonstrated by its commander Miguel Grau. They saw Wasker everywhere at the same time. The Chilean warships did not go alone, they sailed in convoy to protect themselves from the solitary monitor. The terror reached the point that the lighthouse of the port of Valparaiso remained off. To put an end to this situation, all naval resources were put into action with a single objective, the capture of the Wasker. The new Minister of War and Navy, Rafael Sotomayor, ordered that all ships clean the bottom, change boilers in poor condition, repair machinery, and complete cannons to destroy the Wasker. The Combat of Ong Amos, October 8, 1879 the Battle of Ong Amos, which occurred within the framework of the naval campaign of the Pacific War between 1879 and 1883, pitted the Peruvian ship Wasker against a Chilean squadron off Punta Ong Amos, on the then Bolivian coast. That day, Peru's greatest naval hero, Don Miguel Grau Seminario, died in combat. This combat occurred on October 8, 1879, between the Peruvian ship Wasker and the Chilean ships Cochrane, Blanco and Calada and Covadonga. This is within the framework of the War of the Pacific, in 1879-1883. At 9.40 in the morning of that day the Wasker opened fire on the armored Cochrane, but did not cause any major damage. The Chilean ship responded with cannon shots that caused serious damage to the Wasker. 
His brave boss Miguel Grau Seminario died when his command tower exploded. His replacements, Elias Aguirre and Melitin Rodriguez, continued the fight until they were killed by cannon fire from the Blanco and Calada. Lieutenant Pedro Garazan, last leader of the Huascar, tried to sink it, but the Chileans boarded it and took it. This result allowed Chile to dominate the South Pacific to begin the invasion of the Peruvian Department of Tarapaca. Land Campaign of the Pacific War Destroyed our maritime power with the loss of the glorious monitor Huascar and the immolation of Admiral Grau, the Chileans proceeded to invade the long-awaited territory of Peru. They had to start in Tarapaca where the Allied army, Peruvian-Bolivian, was concentrated. The Battle of Pisagua Indeed, a powerful army of 10,000 well-equipped men, commanded by the Chilean Erasmo Escala under the protection of his squadron, left the port of Antofagasta. On November 2, he landed in the port of Pasagua, whose weak garrison of 1,000 men, under the command of Colonel Isaac Ricavarin, knew how to resist the enemy in a heroic fight that finally gave victory to the invaders. The Chilean artillery bombarded the port and caused the saltpeter deposits to burn. The Battle of San Francisco On November 19, in the midst of the confusion and disorder of the Bolivian army due to the news received about its chief and president, the Battle of San Francisco took place. The Peruvian-Bolivian army, commanded by General Buendia, on its march north, encountered the Chilean army in the hills of San Francisco. Without any order to attack, some Peruvian-Bolivian leaders and troops began the battle, climbing the hill. Meanwhile, the rear guard companies, with their rifle volleys, wounded or killed their own compatriots, sowing confusion. In this action, the performance of Colonel Ladislao Espina stood out. The Chileans put the powerful and modern Krupp cannons into action. Battle of Tarapaca After the disaster in San Francisco, the tired Peruvian army of 3,000 men, which did not have artillery or cavalry, moved towards Arica and after a painful march through the deserts he then camped near Tarapaca. While the Chileans occupied the heights that dominate said town. The Battle of Tarapaca occurred within the framework of the War of the Pacific between 1879 and 1883. It was a war between the Chilean armies, which intended to take the city of Tarapaca, and the Peruvian army that defended it. The Peruvian chiefs Andres Avelino Casares, Francisco Bolognesi and Alfonso Ugarte fought in this battle. This battle occurred on November 27, 1879, between the armies of Peru and Chile, within the framework of the War of the Pacific. The Peruvian troops were about to begin the march towards Arica when they were informed of the arrival of a Chilean army from the west. Then Colonels Andres Avelino Casares and Manuel Suarez took their columns towards the hills and surprised the Chilean vanguard, managing to put them to flight. At the same time, in the ravine sector, Francisco Balagnesi's battalion crushed the second in line and took the Chilean flag from him. A new Chilean attack was repelled by the Zepeda battalion of Casares, reinforced by the columns of Alfonso Ugarte, Moore, Melendez and Soma Curcio. The victory was assured when, from Pachica, Justo Pastor de Vila's division arrived. The Chileans, defeated, retreated. Battle of Arica The Chileans advanced towards Arica with 40,000 men, supported by the battleship Almirante Cochran. Arica was in charge of 17,000 men under the command of Colonel Francisco Bolognesi. On June 5, 1880, General Baquedano, Supreme Commander of the Chilean Army, sent Major Juan de la Cruz Salvo, as a parliamentarian, to request Bolognesi to surrender the plaza and offer him an honorable capitulation, answering I have duties. Sacred and I will fulfill them until I burn the last cartridge. On June 7, 1880, the Chileans attacked Arica, taking place the most important military actions in Moro. There, the commander of the square, Colonel Balognesi, as well as more, Blondidin clan and other brave compatriots of ours died fighting with singular courage. The intrepid Colonel Don Alfonso Ugarte, to prevent the flag of the country from falling into the hands of the enemy, threw himself into the sea from the top of Moro, finding death wrapped in our sacred emblem. Among the survivors of this memorable action, the chivalrous and heroic Argentine Colonel Don Roque Sainz Pena stands out, who, driven by his great love for Peru, 
fought in defense of our homeland. Mr. Sainz Pena became, years later, president of Argentina. The Lima Campaign Faced with the defeat in the South, Nicolas de Pierola organized urban militias to confront the enemy by establishing two defensive lines. The first was defeated in the Battle of San Juan on January 13 and precipitated the occupation and destruction of Chorillos. Despite the signing of an armistice, Chilean General Bacuadano also attacked the second line on January 15 in the Battle of Miraflores. The victory for Chile was definitive and the occupation of Lima took place. The Sierra or La Breña Campaign The occupation of Lima moved the fight to the interior. Neither the Peruvian army nor the civilian population were willing to surrender and they turned the mountains into the stage where the fate of the country would be decided. Strategies of the resistance in the Sierra The central Andes were an advantage for the Peruvians, who controlled access to the capital and the arrival of supplies from there. The rugged landscape offered him multiple hiding places and allowed him to control the ascent to the towns. The brave participation of the population was decisive. Main Battles of the Sierra Campaign General Andres A. Caceres organized the resistance with great skill and few resources. For more than two years he faced the Chileans who sent several expeditions to the mountains. After the confrontation in Huamachuco on July 10, 1883, he had to abandon the fight due to lack of supplies. The Resistance in Northern Peru under the command of General Miguel Iglesias, the Army of the Northern Mountains won the Battle of San Pablo in June 1882. However, the general himself prepared to sign peace with Chile, convinced of the difficult situation of the country. This caused a conflict with Cáceres, which ended with the Treaty of Ancon in 1883 and the loss of Tarapaca in favor of the Chileans. Treaty of Peace and Friendship between Peru and Chile, Treaty of Ancon, signed in Lima, on October 20, 1883, Peru ceded to Chile the territory of the littoral de Tarapaca province, which had as its northern limit the river and ravine of Camarones and, to the south, the lower ravine and river. Furthermore, the provinces of Tacna and Arica would continue in the power of Chile for ten years, and upon expiration, a plebiscite would decide whether said provinces would return to Peru or definitively pass to Chile. The plebiscite in question never took place. On the contrary, a policy of persecution of the Peruvians who lived in them and Achilleanization of both provinces would have been put into practice. On June 3, 1929, the Treaty and Complementary Protocol to resolve the question of Tacna and Arica was signed in Lima, which would be the Treaty of Lima. By virtue of this treaty, Tacna returned to Peru and Arica became definitively part of Chilean territory. National Reconstruction National Reconstruction was a period after the Pacific War between the civil wars of 1884-1885 and 1894-1895, where the Peruvian Republic began its economic, political, and social resurgence. The War of the Pacific ended up completing the destruction that had begun with the economic crisis of the 1870s. By 1879, the Peruvian banking system was bankrupt and agriculture, mining and commerce were barely surviving. At the end of the nightmare of war and occupation, the country continued to live. But it was a bloodless, amputated, painful country. The economic situation of the country after the war was quite precarious, the country felt the need to face a future of reconstruction in all its aspects. Peru had lost its main natural resources, its main productive industries, trade had contracted, the main communication routes collapsed or destroyed, uncontrollable inflation and, above all, an enormous external debt with English creditors, which exceeded £50 million sterling, which made it impossible for Peru to receive new international credits. However, in these years new economic resources will appear that will accelerate the country's economic recovery. The exploitation of rubber in the jungle and oil on the north coast began. The exploitation of both natural resources is linked to the phenomenon of the Second Industrial Revolution, which had its greatest exponent in the automobile boom. Likewise, in these years, the slow resurgence of sugar and cotton agro-industrial activity began on the northern coast of the country. The Second Militarism 
The historian Jorge Basadra maintains that militarism or the predominance of the military in power arose in Peru due to the weakness of the civilian ruling class after a time of war, whether internal or external. He also points out three types of militarism that occurred in Republican history, after a victory, after a defeat, and in times of crisis or social chaos. The first militarism occurred after the victory in the War of Independence, to which were added the civil and international wars of the first decades of the Republic. The second militarism occurs after the defeat in the Pacific War and is divided into two moments, the first between 1883 to 1885, which corresponds to the predominance of the blue military led by Miguel Iglesias, who signed peace with Chile, and the second was from 1886 to 1895 and corresponds to the predominance of the Reds led by General Andrés E. Cáceres, the same ones who had resisted the invaders until the end. This new militarism has the difficult task of recomposing the administrative and governmental apparatus of the state and of exercising its authority in order to achieve the participation of citizens to guide the nation towards its recovery. After the catastrophic defeat against Chile, the person who had sufficient prestige and authority to restore social and political order in Peru was General Andrés A. Cáceres, hero of the Breña resistance. Cáceres faced the then-president Miguel Iglesias, who had signed the peace treaty with Chile with territorial session and had asserted himself in power with the support of Chilean arms. Thus a civil war broke out. Cáceres demonstrated his military strategy by putting Iglesias' main army out of action in the town of Huarapampa, central Peruvian mountains, an action known as the Huarapampita in 1884. He then attacked Lima, where his forces surrounded the government palace to Iglesias. He resigned from the presidency in 1885, being succeeded by the provisional government of the Council of Ministers, headed by Antonio Arenas, which called elections in which Cáceres won overwhelmingly. During his first constitutional government, 1886-1890, Cáceres undertook national reconstruction. He founded his own party, the Constitutional Party, or Cacerista. But his access to state control implied the establishment of a political pact with civilism. It was this consensus that allowed Cáceres and his successor, then Colonel Remigio Morales Bermudez in 1890-1894, to retain political control for almost a decade amidst public peace. With the death of Morales Bermudez, as a result of a sudden illness in April 1894, the political crisis began again. After a brief period under Justiniano Borgono, Cáceres returned to the presidency in 1894 in disputed elections, which led to the formation of the national coalition against him, made up of Democrats and civilists, led by the leader Nicolas de Pierrela a bloody civil war broke out that culminated in the coalition's assault on Lima, before which Cáceres resigned and went into exile in 1895. The government of a national board chaired by Manuel Canamo was established, who called elections in which Nicolás de Pierrela was elected. He carried out important economic reforms and achieved political stability in the country, consolidating the presidential system. Pierrela was the one who consolidated the national reconstruction, inaugurating a new stage called the Aristocratic Republic, both terms coined by Basadra, which would last during the first two decades of the 20th century. Economic Situation Years before the outbreak of the Pacific War, the Peruvian economy was severely hit. Guano had ceased to be the main source of resources. Peru had declared bankruptcy in 1876 and, unable to pay its large external debt, decreed a moratorium. It was for this reason that he neglected his national defense and was unable to modernize his squadron, a situation that Chile precisely took advantage of to unleash the War of 1879. In this regard, it is said that, during those years, Chile was also going through economic difficulties, but unlike Peru, that country had been arming itself during those years, acquiring the two powerful armored vehicles with which it obtained naval supremacy in the Pacific. If already in the years prior to the conflict, the Peruvian economy was in a critical situation, with the development of the war it was practically destroyed. After the war with Chile ended, Peru had to face a series of problems that existed before the outbreak of the conflict. The main one was precisely the external debt with British creditors. These, once the Peace of Ancon was signed, demanded that the Peruvian government cancel the debt. 
Peru was at a crossroads, it did not have the necessary resources to make that payment, and at the same time, it urgently required capital to reactivate its export economy, without which it was impossible to pay its debt. This amounted to about £37 million sterling, the annual amortization of which required a payment of about £2.5 million, a sum that was then impossible for the country to raise. So the settlement of the debt was of utmost urgency. This was understood by the first government of Andres A. Acaceres, which devoted itself fully to the matter, until signing the Grace Contract, by virtue of which the Peruvian state ceded control and administration of its main productive resources to its English creditors, railroads and guano, in exchange for the complete extinction of their debt. Cáceres had to convene three extraordinary congresses and expel the opposition deputies so that Congress could ratify the contract in July 1889. For better administration of the resources they received, the English creditors converted their foreign debt bonds into shares of the Peruvian Corporation, the most important British company that was created to implement the agreements of said contract. In its essence, the new organization of the economy combined the monopolization of resources, a massive injection of foreign capital and ability to subject traditional economies to its service, and a deep and complete subordination to the external market. From 1885 to 1895, silver, sugar and rubber, in this order, were the main Peruvian export products. At the same time, significant industrial development took place under the impulse of national capital, initially reflected in the textile sector. In this new stage of the Peruvian economy, which would last until the world crash of 1929, exports were more diversified. The mountains supplied wool, from sheep and camelids, and metals, silver, gold and copper, among others. The Amazon contributed coffee, coca and rubber. And the coast with sugar and cotton. Topic 10. The Aristocratic Republic to the Third Militarism. It is known as the Aristocratic Republic from 1895 to 1919, the era in the history of Peru characterized by the political dominance of an oligarchy dedicated to agricultural exports, mining and finance, through the civil party. The term was coined by the historian Jorge Basadra. This period begins with the rise to power of the politician of the Arequipa lawyer Nicolas de Pierola, which marks the beginning of a succession of democratically elected governments, until the coup of Augusto B. Leguia in 1919. The only interruption of this succession occurs in 1914 when, due to differences between the civil party and Guillermo Billinghurst, General Oscar R. Benavides carried out a coup d'état to call general elections. It is the longest period of democratic succession in the history of Peru and begins the republican history of this country in the 20th century. Broadly speaking, the characteristics of this period are the following. 1. Economic dependence on English capitalism. 2. Development of new economic activities, agro-export, sugar and cotton, rubber extraction and oil extraction. 3. Political predominance of the civil party in the executive and legislative branches. The Democratic or Pieralist Party became the opposition, although it progressively diminished its presence on the political scene. Civilism suffered, however, a schism, dividing into classical civilism and Liguism. 4. Emergence of organized labor movements, anarcho-syndicalism. Ideology of the Aristocratic Republic. The way of thinking and ideas in this period were marked by the elitist perspective of the government and by a marked contempt for the popular classes. It was thought that the government should be of an exclusive, powerful, repressive and aristocratic elite, its vision was Europeanizing, trying as much as possible to establish parameters of creation, government, education, fashion and lifestyles in English and linguistic idioms. French mainly, they felt closer to Europe than to the interior of Peru itself since they lived in the most exclusive areas of Lima, the center of contact between Peru and the outside world, with little or no knowledge of the sufferings of the workers. Of its factories, mines and farms on the coast and mountains of the country. Furthermore, this period of history was marked by a powerful racist and contemptuous image towards the indigenous human and cultural element, whom they considered barbarians. In this way, the Peruvian aristocracy lived with its back to the popular and cultural sectors of the country. 
political, social, and rural conflicts. The aristocratic republic was not stable, as there were power struggles due to individual rivalries and between different clans. These factions were grouped around the leaders, within the civil party were Leguia, Villanueva, and Pardo. At the Congress there were also groups of followers of Pierola, Leguia, and Pardo. This factionalism and power struggles reached its climax with the split of an important part of the civilismo when Leguia was in power, leading to the weakening of the civilista party. The working class was not homogeneous, in Peru it was divided by social origin and also by geography. The most organized workers were those who were in Lima and fundamentally those linked to the export sector were those who could obtain improvements to their demands. The mutualism that associated workers for many years gave way to anarchism, which was the way workers used to complain about their low wages and terrible working conditions. With the support of the workers, the first populist president of Peru is elected, who is then overthrown by the elite through the armed forces. With the start of the First World War, both imports and exports were affected, but once foreign demand restarted, it produced unexpected profits with the rise in product prices. It is in this period that mining and oil spend completely in the hands of a monopoly of foreign companies. And this is when Americans begin to have more preponderance in the country's economy. This era of prosperity caused the elites to dedicate themselves intensely to export based merely on the accumulation of wealth, neglecting the production of national manufactures for domestic consumption, which would be one of the causes of the subsequent worsening of the economic conditions of the workers and of social conflicts. Rulers of the Aristocratic Republic Nicolas de Pierola, 1895-1899 He establishes the Peruvian pound of gold and the estanco of salt. He gives great support to the foundation of credit and financial institutions. The Chorillos Military School is founded and compulsory military service is established. Lopez de Romana, 1899-1903 North American investment in mining was stimulated by the Pasco Hill Mining Company. The mining, commerce and water codes were promulgated. Construction of the La Arroya, Cerro de Pasco Railway began and diplomatic relations with Chile were broken. Manuel Candamo, 1903-1904 He governs after being elected by the civil party. He proposes a large railroad construction project. He did not finish his presidential term. José Pardo y Barreda, 1904-1908 The great social mobilization of workers takes place with the Federation of Bakers Estrella del Peru. Night schools are created and the La Araya Huancaya Railway is built. The Crypt of Heroes is built. First Government of Augusto Leguía, 1908-1912 he faced the Pierolists of the Democratic Party to come to power. I promote the colonization of the jungle. The first work accident law was enacted. Border problems occurred on all borders, Bolivia, Ecuador, Brazil, Chile, and Colombia. William Billinghurst, 1912-1914 An eight-hour working day was achieved for the workers of the Calau Dock, and the right to strike was regulated. Faced with the wave of strikes, the civilists opted for the military coup with Oscar Benavides. Second Government of José Pardo y Barreda, 1915-1919 It broke relations with Germany during the First World War. The peasant uprising of Rumi Maki took place. The international arbitration of the Brea and Perinus matter took place. Exports rose. Eight hours of work were established nationally. Casares supported Leguia's coup d'état. Third militarism. It is stated that the third militarism arose in the face of the political vacuum and the impotence of traditional party groups in the face of the new social movements that were stalking the state. It was inaugurated with the military uprising of Luis Sanchez with the support of popular urban sectors who saw the possibility of participating in the political life of the country against the new homeland regime, which was a consequence of the international economic crisis. Coup against Leguia Sanchez Cerro revolted in Arequipa on August 22, 1930. 
The Arequipa Statement was written by José Luis Bustamante y Rivero. To dominate the situation, Leguía attempted to form a military cabinet, but in the early hours of the morning of August 25, the Lima garrison requested his resignation. The government board chaired by Sanchez Cerro governed from August 27, 1930 to March 1, 1931. On December 8 of that same year, the new Congress was installed with constituent powers and before this assembly, Samanez handed over power to the triumphant candidate that same day. The Government Board, 1930-1931 The economic crisis that Peru had suffered since 1929 was worsened by the political crisis. The industries did not produce and the state had no money. Workers' riots occurred in different places and university conflicts. Sanchez Cerro called for general elections for the President of the Republic and new Congress and intended to present himself as a candidate. Uprisings occurred in Calao, Arequipa, and other places, with Sanchez Cerro ending up resigning from the government board, along with the other members of the board, March 1, 1931. Elections of 1931 for the 1931 elections, the strongest candidates were Luis Sanchez Cerro with the political party Union Revolucionaria, the other candidate was Hea de la Torre with the political party APRA. On election day, October 1931, Luis Sanchez Cerro won the victory, being proclaimed by the national election jury and being sworn in on December 8, 1931. That same day, the apristas called the elections fraudulent and in Trujillo, the leader of the APRA Hea de la Torre gave a historic speech and the operas went so far as to say about him he is the moral president of Peru. Government of Luis M. Sanchez Cerro, 1931-1933 Luis Sanchez Cerro returned to power in December 1930, beginning his second term by harshly repressing the APRA party, declaring it, once again, outside the law. Political aspect. The emergency law was enacted in December 1931 to protect internal order and control the excesses that were promoted both in parliament and on the streets against the government. The political constitution of 1933 was promulgated, which attempted to configure a parliamentary regime, reduce the powers of the president, reduce the number of votes necessary in Congress to be able to question a minister or censure a ministerial cabinet. Persecution and deportation of APRA parliamentarians, among whom Luis Alberto Sanchez and Carlos Manuel Cox stand out. Uprising of a small sector of the Navy in 1932, all opposition newspapers were closed, the Universidad Mayor de San Marco was closed for fear of student revolts. Economic Aspect The crash or economic crisis of 1929 dramatically affected Peru, exports fell and investments too all of which generated a series of anti-social protests. It was an especially critical period for the country due to the economic crisis that affected the world at that time. The prices of export products such as cotton, wool, sugar and minerals fell considerably while the currency decreased its purchasing power. Peru entered a stage of profound political, economic and social crisis. The traditional political parties were entering into crisis and new ones with a social revolutionary tendency appeared, mainly the Aprista Party. Social Aspect Among the most important events we have, in March 1932, the young APRA man, José Melgar, tried to assassinate the president. Sánchez Cerro and the Mother Church of Miraflores, being captured and sentenced to imprisonment. Then, there was the capture and confinement of the apristas, such as the representatives of Congress and the capture of their leader Hea de la Torre, who was taken to the penitentiary and put on trial. Next, the mutiny of the cruisers Grau and Balagnesi took place, leading to the surrender and execution of eight insurgents. Then the operation of the University of San Marcos was suspended on May 8, 1932. But the most important event was the Trujillo Uprising on July 7, 1932. In it, apristas from Hacienda Laredo, students from the San Juan National School under the command of Manuel Barreto called El Buffalo took over the Adonovan barracks in the city appointing Augustin Hea de la Torre as prefect. During the early hours of the morning the apristas murdered chiefs and officers of the barracks, while from Lima they were ordered colonel. Manuel Ruiz Bravo the repression of the movement with bombing of the city. 
Once the city was recovered, on July 11 and 14, the army shot an undetermined number of apristas in the ruins of Chanchan. This uprising had repercussions in Juarez and Wari. The first had been directed by APRA Carlos Phillips, to whom the phrase is attributed, only God will save souls, only APRA will save Peru. International Situation On May 1, 1932, a group of angry Peruvians in Leticia requested the Congress review the Salomon-Lazano Treaty signed by Leguia with Colombia. During the early hours of September 1, 1932, they took over the port of Leticia on the Amazon River with the support of military commanders in the area. The Sanchez Cerro government decided to support the action of the people of Leticia by entrusting General Oscar R. Benavides with the direction of the troops. Deciding to intensify the war, the president summoned the reservists who would go to the conflict zone, they paraded through the Santa Beatriz racecourse in Lima. Events during Sanchez Cerro's government The struggle between Sanchezerismo and Aprismo unleashed a civil war, a time of barbarism and primitivism, with disastrous barbaric consequences. In the first months, a parliamentary debate began amid shouts, expletives and threats between operas and government members. The 1933 policy is promulgated, the emergency law is given to directly combat APRA, the public force arrested 22 APRA representatives at their homes and expelled them from the country, declaring their positions vacant. The same thing happened with Gustavo Jimenez and some journalists. On March 6, 1932, Hea de la Torre was arrested, put on trial for the crime of inciting revolutionary action, and locked up in the Panopticon. On Sunday, March 23, 1932, when President Sanchez Serra was entering to hear Mass in the Mother Church of Miraflores, a young aprista shot him at point-blank range, miraculously saving him. The day after this event, the crew members of the cruisers Grau and Balognesi mutinied. The rebels were defeated, tried and eight sailors were shot. The government minister praised this execution, so the Congress censured the cabinet and in retaliation the parliamentary majority censured the president of the Congress. On March 8, the University of San Marcos was closed. On July 7, 1932, groups of Aprista sugarcane workers stormed the Adonovan barracks in Trujillo. Augustin Haya de la Torre, brother of Victor Raul, assumed the political leadership of the movement. To crush the insurgents, the government sent forces from Lima. I attacked the city by air and land. The combat was bloody, house to house. Exalted mobs entered the prison and murdered the officers, soldiers and guards, some of them savagely mutilated. It is not really known how many fell on both sides, but the number was very large. In addition, a fierce repression was carried out and many APRA were captured in the ruins of Chanchan. This terrible crime opened a chasm between APRA and the armed forces. Murder of Sanchez Cerro On Sunday, April 30, 1933, Sanchez Cerro attended a patriotic parade after having reviewed 20,000 mobilizables, reservists who were given training once a week, at the Santa Beatriz Hippodrome, today Campo de Marte, when he was leaving in an open car, he was shot dead by an APRA fanatic Abelardo Mendoza Leva. The murderer was killed at the same scene. According to the Constitution, the Council of Ministers assumed executive power. He immediately suspended constitutional guarantees and declared a state of siege throughout the Republic. That same day the Constituent Congress met and appointed General Oscar Raimundo Benavides Laria as President of the Republic. Elections of 1939 and End of the Third Militarism for the 1939 elections, the Aprista Party and the Communist Party were banned due to their international ideology, the Revolutionary Union, upon the death of Sanchez Cerro, had lost the support of the masses, and the Civil Party had not managed to reconstitute itself. The candidates were José Quesada and Manuel Prado. The banker Prado overwhelmingly won his rival, adding 262,971 votes to 76,142. The 11th of Ligia. The Ancinio of Ligia was the time of the government of Augusto Bernardino Ligia in Peru, between 1919 and 1930. 
It was characterized by the displacement of civilism as the predominant political force, the cult of personality, and a dictatorial and populist style of government. Economically, there was an opening, considered excessive by some authors, to foreign capital, especially American capital. He strengthened the state, began the modernization of the country, and undertook a vast plan of public works, financed by loans, and whose immediate purpose was to grandly celebrate the centennial of the independence of Peru in 1921. In the ideological aspect, the collapse of the political parties occurred. Traditions and the emergence of new currents, such as aprism and communism. Although in theory Legia wanted to adhere to the constitution and run a government with respect for democratic principles, in practice his government restricted public freedoms. The printing presses of the newspapers El Comercio and La Prensa were attacked by mobs with undeniable government leadership. The press, where the opposition had taken refuge, was confiscated, practically ending freedom of expression. He also swept aside the opposition in Congress. Which he subordinated to his commands. The deputies Jorge and Manuel Prado and Ugartesh, the first for the province of Dos de Mayo, and the second for that of Huamachuco, were arrested and exiled. On the other hand, he ended the municipalities elected by popular vote to replace them with personnel appointed by the government. Opponents of the government were persecuted, imprisoned, deported, and even shot. Prominent among the exiles is the then young student leader Victor Raul Haya de la Torre, who led the famous protest in Lima against the consecration of the Sacred Heart of Jesus to the government on May 23, 1923, in which a worker and a student died. In exile, Haya founded APRA, a party with continental projection initially with anti imperialist and anti oligarchic ideology. Other opponents of the government, such as the young journalists Jose Carlos Mariategui and Cesar Falcon, were sent to Europe on scholarships. Mariategui, upon returning to Peru, already imbued with Marxism Leninism, founded the Peruvian Socialist Party. Other exiles were Colonel Oscar R. Benavides, former president of Peru, Arturo Osores, Luis Fernand Cisneros, and Victor Andres Biland. The island of San Lorenzo, in front of Calao, Was enabled as a public prison where opponents were confined, whether they were civil professionals, military personnel, or students. The island of Tequil, in Lake Titicaca, served the same purpose. The modernization of the country had already been tested by previous governments, but under the Ancenio of Legia it received its definitive impetus. The main bases of this modernizing leap were the state, which became the engine of development. Legia considered that the state should be strengthened and intervene in a more dynamic and dominant way to promote the country's prosperity. He thus distanced himself from the state model of civilism, the same one that had been based on liberal theories. In this way, the budget of the republic grew enormously, that is, the state radically expanded its expenses in order to implement a vast program of public works. The return of the policy of large loans. Something that had not happened in Peru since the 1860s and 1870s. The bad memory of these last loans, which had caused bankruptcy prior to the war with Chile, was overcome in the government he arranged enormous loans with American banks, with which he financed his vast public works plan. Thus began Peru's dependence on North American capitalism, which would inevitably force it to subordinate itself to all interests of that power. An example of the latter was the Paris Award and the solution to the conflict with Colombia, as we will see later. Legia faced the thorny issue of La Brea and Perinis. This was a lawsuit that consisted of the American company International Petroleum Company, subsidiary of Standard Oil of New Jersey, exploiting the oil fields of La Brea and Perinis, northern Peru, without contributing to the Treasury the real amount of taxes on the which was obligated according to Peruvian law. Taking advantage of an old error in the measurement of belongings. Congress in 1918 had agreed that the matter be submitted to international arbitration, but Legia, under pressure from the U.S. government, preferred to reach a transactional agreement. This was signed on March 2, 1922, between the Peruvian Foreign Minister Alberto Salomon and the English representative Mr. A. C. Grant Duff. This Salomon Grant Duff transactional agreement was presented to the arbitration court, 
which met in Paris and was made up of the president of the Swiss federal court and the representatives of the Peruvian and English governments. On April 24th of that year, 1922, without further discussion, they approved the transactional agreement, which they granted the status of award, the conditions of which were binding on the high contracting parties as a solution to the controversy that arose. The agreements of the so-called Paris Award were the following. The property of La Brea y Perinas comprised an area of 41,614 properties and covered the soil and subsoil or mineralized area. The owners and tenants would pay for 50 years the amount of 30 sols per year per working property and one sol per non-working property. The belongings that were no longer exploited would pay one sol and those that were abandoned would become the property of the government. The owners and or tenants would pay the corresponding export tax, which could not be increased for 20 years. The owners would only pay 1 million pesos, American gold, for contributions accrued as of December 31, 1921. In turn, the government of Peru annulled previous resolutions that were opposed to the spirit and execution of what was stipulated here. This arbitration award was clearly adverse to the interests of Peru since it established a tax exception regime for the owners and exploiters of La Brea and Perinas. The Treasury thus stopped receiving substantial amounts of money as taxes. The government of Augusto B. Leguia thus established a precedent of submission to American interests that would give rise to nationalist protests over several decades. Leguia began talks with Colombia to definitively solve the border issue, which tended to become a centenary since it dated back to the time of independence. Colombia aspired to legitimize its border from the Caquita River to the Putumayo River, territorial strip that Peru actually occupied, thanks to the actions of the Peruvian rubber tappers, as well as obtain access to the Amazon River. Previous Peruvian governments had refused to give in to Colombian claims, but Ligia, in his obsession to resolve the dispute once and for all, promoted the Salomon Lozano Treaty, which was signed by the Peruvian Foreign Minister Alberto Salomon and the Colombian Minister Fabio Lozano Torrijos, in Lima. On March 24, 1922. This meant ceding to Colombia an extensive territorial portion between the Caquita and Putumayo rivers and the so-called Amazonian trapeze, where the Peruvian population of Leticia was located, bordering the Amazon River. In this way, Colombia gained access to this river, which until then was only shared by Peru and Brazil. The treaty was approved by the Congress submissive to Leguia in 1927 and was put into execution in 1930. When the treaty was made public, it caused great resistance among the Peruvians who lived in the affected areas, thus arising a conflictive state between both nations that would worsen. In 1932, it was said that Leguia signed this treaty with Colombia under pressure from the United States, which wanted to somehow compensate Colombia for Panama's independence. But geopolitical calculations must also have taken precedence in Leguia, with the treaty, Colombia was gained as an ally, which until then had been close to Ecuador in its claim to Peruvian Amazon territories. In fact, upon learning of the signing of the treaty, Ecuador broke relations with Colombia. And a Colombian-Ecuadorian alliance against Peru would have had disastrous consequences for the latter, without a doubt. End of the 11th anniversary of Augusto Bernardino Ligia The fall occurred quickly as a consequence of the global crisis of capitalism, especially North American capitalism, which was evidenced by the bankruptcy of the New York Stock Exchange, October 24, 1929, on Black Thursday. The fall in shares and the liquidation of important transnational companies dragged down their branches in Latin America. Our raw materials were no longer sold or prices fell sharply. During the fall of the 11th, public works and activities in provincial enclaves were also paralyzed, generating immense unemployment, mining, migrations to Lima, protests, subversive activities, etc. The pro-American dictatorship in Latin America fell in series, Hernando Siles in Bolivia, Carlos Ibanez in Chile, Washington Luis in Brazil, Hippolito Iragoy in Argentina, etc., and in Peru Ligia. On August 22, 1930, Commander Luis Miguel Sanchez Cerro, former defender of civilism in Arequipa, revolted. 
Legia was arrested and taken to the San Lorenzo prison and then to the Bella Vista Naval Clinic, where he wrote his memoirs Yo Tirano, Yo Thief, and died on February 6, 1932. He was 69 years old. Founder of the American Popular Revolutionary Alliance. Victor Raul Haya de la Torre. Victor Raul Haya de la Torre, born in Trujillo on February 22, 1895, and died in Lima on August 2, 1979, was a Peruvian thinker and politician. He is the founder of the American Popular Revolutionary Alliance and historical leader of the Peruvian Aprista Party, the PRA, the longest running and most organically consistent party in Peruvian politics. He is recognized as one of the most important political ideologues in Latin America and a key figure for Peruvian and American politics. The Peruvian Aprista Party is a Peruvian political party initially projected on a continental scale, APRA, with a position similar to the center-left and a member of the Socialist International. The acronym APRA comes from the name of the American Popular Revolutionary Alliance, the initial proposal of its founder Victor Raul Haya de la Torre to form a network of anti-imperialist social and political movements in Latin America. Its militants are called comrades due to the fraternity created by Haya de la Torre. It is among the oldest political parties in America. Among the Peruvian political parties in activity, it is the longest-lived, characterized by having been stripped of electoral victories by military coups or military governments after having triumphed at the polls, it also went through two long periods of illegality, both under military and civilian governments, having been chased by Luis Miguel Sanchez Cerro and Manuel Odria. The Peruvian Aprista Party has come to power democratically on two occasions, in 1985 and in 2006, both under the candidacy of Alan Garcia. Peruvian Socialist Party The Peruvian Socialist Party, PSP, was a Peruvian political party with a socialist orientation. On October 7, 1928, José Carlos Mariategui, together with Julio Porto Carrero, Avelino Navarro, César Hinojosa, Fernando Borja, Ricardo Martínez Latorre and Bernardo Regman founded the Peruvian Socialist Party, a Marxist, anti-feudal and anti-imperialist party, which had in its beginnings, there was a clear influence from Mariategui, who proposed building in Latin America a socialism without copy or copy that would be applied to the concrete reality of each country, although without ceasing to be classist and Marxist. Another peculiarity was that it had as its main actors not only to the proletariat but also to the peasantry. The PSP would lay the foundations for the creation of the General Confederation of Workers of Peru and would have great influence on the labor movement. In 1929, the delegates of the Peruvian Socialist Party, Hugo Pesci and Julio Porto Carrero, presented the problem of race raised by Mariategui in Buenos Aires and Montevideo at the Congress of the Latin American Faction of the Third International, however, the Third International ended. For discarding Mariategui's theses, the same ones that would fall into oblivion within the Peruvian Socialist Party after Mariategui's death. José Carlos Mariategui the book Seven Essays of Interpretation of Peruvian Reality, or simply The Seven Essays, is considered the masterpiece of the Peruvian writer and sociologist José Carlos Mariategui. Published in Lima in 1928, it made its author one of the most widespread Marxist voices in Latin America. It is a work that has been republished dozens of times, as well as translated into Russian, French, English, Italian, Portuguese and Hungarian. On April 16, 1930, Mariategui died on the eve of a trip to Buenos Aires to have his old injury treated. The Socialist Party became the Communist Party of Peru. Government of Fernando Belon de Terry Fernando Belon Terry was president of the Republic of Peru in two periods, from 1963 to 1968 and the next was from 1980 to 1985. He was born in Lima on October 7, 1912. Son of Rafael Biland Diaz Canseco and Lucila Terry Garcia. He completed his primary studies at the Recoleta School and his secondary studies in Paris because his father was exiled. In that city he began those corresponding to electricity and industrial mechanics. In the United States he studied at the University of Miami and at the University of Austin in Texas, 
where he obtained the title of architect in 1935. He returned to Peru and in 1937 founded the magazine El Arquitecto Peruano. In 1947 he was appointed professor of urban planning at the Pontifical Catholic University of Lima, that year he founded the Institute of Urban Planning of Peru, which was later integrated into the School of Engineers. Beginnings in the Politics of Fernando Belon Terry in 1944 he contributed to the formation of the National Democratic Front that nominated the presidential candidacy of José Luis Bustamante y Rivero, on whose lists he was elected deputy for Lima for the period 1945-1948. After the Congress was dissolved by the military in 1948, he restarted his professional activities. Teaching urbanism at the National School of Engineers starting in 1949. The following year he assumed the head of the Department of Architecture of the National School of Engineers, and from 1955 he served as Dean of the Faculty of Architecture at the already created National University of Engineering. Until 1960. In 1956 he ran as a presidential candidate for the Democratic Youth Front, which would give rise to popular action, after Prado's triumph he dedicated himself to touring the country. In 1962 he presented himself as a candidate in the frustrated elections, and the following year he was elected president of the republic with the support of popular action and Christian democracy. One of his first acts of government was the nationalization of the Caja de Depositos y Consignations. Engaged in Peruvian work, he faced the pro alliance that put serious obstacles in his administrative work. He was concerned about the construction of communication routes, and among his projects was the Bolivarian or Marginal de la Selva Highway. Almost at the end of his government, the so-called Talara Act was signed with the International Petroleum Company, considered onerous for the country's interests. This, and the manifest political, economic and social crisis that was taking place in Peru, were the justification for the coup d'état led by General Juan Velasco Alvarado which overthrew him on October 3, 1968. He was deported to Argentina. He went to the United States and in Washington he dedicated himself to university teaching and giving lectures, in that city he married Violetta Correa Miller. In 1977 he returned to Peru and abstained from participating in the elections to the Constituent Assembly from 1978 to 1979. On May 18, 1980, he was elected president of the republic for the second time, with 43% of the valid votes, and with an absolute majority in both chambers. He immediately called municipal elections and restored the newspapers expropriated by the government of Juan Velasco Alvarado to their owners. During his second government there were droughts in the south and serious floods as a result of the rains caused by the El Niño phenomenon in 1983 in the north, terrorism grew and there was an escalation of strikes and stoppages. He ordered the construction of the residential complexes of the San Borja and Lima Tambo Towers among other works. At the end of his term he retained his place as senator for life in accordance with current laws. Ilan Terry is the author of the books The Conquest of Peru by the Peruvians, People by People, who have the ideology of his party, and The Marginal Road of the Jungle. His work reveals a great connoisseur of the country, he knows about Peru like few Peruvians, whose journey has meant years of travel, reaching the most remote places in his territory. He currently lives in Lima with his second wife, from his first marriage to Carola Aubrey he has three children, Rafael, Fernando and Carola, the first is a geologist, the second is dedicated to activities linked to mining, and the third works for the United Nations. Fernando Belonteri died on June 5th. 2002, at the age of 89, after suffering a stroke. End of Government The Talara Act and the Scandal on page 11 The City of Talara in 1945 Upon assuming the presidency, Deland offered to solve the problem of La Brea and Perinas in 90 days. This was a shameful lawsuit for the nation that had already been unresolved for several decades, consisted of the fact that the American Transnational Company International Petroleum Company, IPC, had been illegally exploiting the La Brea and Perinas oil fields, located in the north of Peru, without contributing to the Treasury the amount owed, which had been accumulating over the years. During the first year of government, 
Bilan sent a bill to Congress to declare null and void the so-called Paris Agreement, Convention and Award, signed in 1922, during Ligia's time and which had favored the IPC, and requested that the La Brea and Perinus will come under the control of the Fiscal Oil Company, a Peruvian state company, for greater control and benefit of the state within the Treasury. In response, Congress issued Law No. 14696, which declared the award null and void, but did not rule on the transfer of La Brea and Perinus to the Empresa Petrolera Fiscal. The executive branch promulgated the law on November 4, 1963, thus being authorized to solve the old problem. But in the following years, the matter remained stagnant, until, in 1968, during the fifth year of Bilan's government, which would be the last, talks were resumed with the IPC. Apparently, Bilan's idea was not only to try to solve the economic-political problem with the company, but he was convinced that the solution to the problem could generate the foreign economic aid necessary to solve the financial problems, which had begun to show great signs. Failures in the system and in the strengthening of the state. The aid, which he had planned, would come from the United States Agency for International Development aid in the same amount that had been given to Chile or Colombia. This economic support mechanism would reduce dependence on expensive supplier credits, on the contrary, the soft loans that come from the IDB and Aid Social Program Fund would give Peru abundant resources. Thus, in July 1968, negotiations began with the IPC in the government palace. Congress had given the corresponding permission for the president and a commission to solve the oil conflicts. The negotiations took an important turn between August 12 and 13, 1968. Finally, the Talara Act was signed, signed by President Belond, by the President of the Senate Carlos Manuel Cox, by the President of the Chamber of Deputies Andres Townsend Escura and by senior IPC officials. By the Talara Act, all the La Brea and Perinus oil fields were transferred to the government so that the EPF could take charge of them, while the IPC kept the already obsolete Talara refinery. A 10-year contract was also made for the sale of natural gas by the EPF to the IPC and a similar 6-year contract for the sale of crude oil from La Brea and Perinus to the IPC refinery in Talara. The IPC would be in charge of the national distribution of fuel and the so-called Lima concessions. This new distribution of fuel gave the IPC a monopoly on the market. This news was widely publicized in the media. The whole country exploded with joy because it was described as the end of the old problem of La Brea and Perinus. However, public opinion changed when a sector of the press, Oiga magazine, made known the conditions that had been imposed. The IPC for the signing of the minutes. The peak moment of the scandal came on September 10, when the resigning president of the EPF, engineer Carlos Loret de Mola, denounced on television that a page was missing from the contract that established the conditions of the purchase sale of crude oil between the EPF and the IPC. That page was the last of three sets of four sides, twelve in total, of a paper called Sayo Sixth, which was a numbered paper officially issued by the Peruvian state and was used to carry out commercial transactions and contracts in general. Lorit de Mola implied that the page had been deliberately lost and that it contained an important part of the general agreement with the IPC, particularly the summary that explained the minimum price of $1.08 for each barrel of crude oil that the IPC would charge the company EPF. Thus the page 11 scandal broke out, which would be the trigger for the end of the already weakened Beyond government. The wave of criticism not only came from Congress and its opposition majority, but was a very strong communication campaign that discredited the agreement, the government and the people who had participated in it. The government was accused of surrender, since it was supposedly favoring the IPC in the sale of crude oil, in compensation for the delivery of La Brea and Perinus. Topic 11. Peru-Indiana, the last decades. Revolutionary government of the armed forces. The Peruvian military socialist government, 1968-1980, was a period of military rule in the history of Peru where the country was led under a nationalist government made up of members of the armed forces, headed by the general, who took political power through the coup d'état of October 3, 1968. It had two phases, the first, under the leadership of Juan Velasco Alvarado and the second, after the replacement in power by Francisco Morales Bermudez. 
First Phase Juan Velasco Alvarado came to power after the scandal of the Tulara Act and Pagina 11 through a coup d'etat on October 3, 1968, against President Fernando Bilonteri, being head of the Joint Command of the Armed Forces from Peru. Reforms by Velasco Alvarado The Velasco government, unlike other military dictatorships in the region, assumed a clearly left-wing and nationalist character and carried out a series of reforms that had a great impact on Peruvian social and economic development. Among the main initiatives of this government were On October 4 with Decree Law No. 17065, the nullity of the contract concluded with the IPC and the Tulara Act and through Decree Law 17066, the Tulara Industrial Complex, Refinery, Facilities and Annexes were expropriated by the revolutionary government of the Force Armada. With this decree the Fiscal Oil Company was entrusted with the administration of the fields and the Tulara Industrial Complex. Later, to continue with oil exploitation, the state entity Petroperu was created. On October 9, 1968, the government ordered the seizure of the IPC facilities in Tulara, which was carried out by the forces of the 1st Military Region based in Pura, under the command of General Fermin Malaga. The agrarian reform on June 29, 1969, with the motto Peasant, the boss will not eat more of your poverty which aimed to liquidate the practices of land ownership in Peru. To manage the expropriated properties, cooperative and associative property systems were established, such as the agrarian cooperatives of social production, CAPS, and the agricultural societies of social interest, SAIS, which were made up of workers from the large estates and communities dedicated to agriculture and livestock. However, the farmers were not prepared to manage such cooperatives. Mismanagement and debt caused the agricultural crisis. Nationalized the fishing industry in June 1973, creating Pesca Peru. The nationalization of the mines of the USA Cerro de Pasco Cooper Corporation, creating Centrum in Peru and Monero Peru Commercial or Minpico. The increase in labor rights, unions were consolidated and workers were assigned business shares without being prepared to perform that function. The confiscation of the media in 1974, a measure that, despite being announced as a way of handing over the media to the living forces of the country, only became a way of violating and suppressing the right to freedom of the press. The Educational Reform, 1972, directed by General Alfredo Carpio Becerra. This reform questioned official teaching, based on the imposition of elite points of view, and the rigidity of the prevailing school system, and was intended to reduce social differences in education, instead contributing, in the long term, to the decline in the qualifications of teachers who in subsequent years would demand increasing privileges by organizing into unions. On the other hand, this reform created initial and special education in Peru, as well as public high school and bilingual education for Quechua speakers, promoting the construction of schools in various areas of the country. The approaches of the educational reform were awarded at the time by UNESCO. Another important aspect of these reforms was the dignity of the humble and indigenous population, who began to have greater participation in political and social life through the reforms carried out. In the economic field, the military regime, in addition to imposing greater state control over productive activities, encouraged the development of national industry by restricting imports of manufactures, which led to the creation of factories and assembly in the country. Cars from different and prestigious brands On February 5, 1975, riots and looting took place in the historic center of Lima, unleashed by a bloody police strike. The looting was one of the most radical actions, which, together with the harsh repression of the armed forces that occurred at the continuation and the imposition of a strict curfew led to the replacement of Juan Velasco Alvarado by General Francisco Morales Bermudez on August 29, 1975, which began the second stage of the revolutionary government in Peru. Second Stage On August 29, 1975, Major General E.P. Francisco Morales Bermudez Cerruti, then President of the Council of Ministers, led a coup d'etat from the city of Tacna and overthrew Velasco in an action that became known as the Tacnezo, alleging the poor economic situation and the deteriorating health of Velasco, whose leg had to be amputated in 1973, died on December 24, 1977 and his funeral was crowded.
The result of social unrest were two general strikes called by unions such as the CGTP. The first strike took place on July 19, 1977, demanding an improvement in the labor and salary situation, and the second in May of the following year, with a somewhat broader list of demands. The Tupac Amaru Plan The Tupac Amaru Plan announced the return to democracy, the promotion of external investment and the transfer of the press to its legitimate owners. Everything had to be done progressively. Transit to Democracy Faced with this pressure, a constituent assembly was convened in 1978, chaired by Victor Raul Haya de la Torre, historical leader of APRA, which drafted the 1979 Constitution, which was the culminating point in reflection of the reforms and processes of change that occurred during throughout these years, establishing, among other things. The military regime ended with the calling of the 1980 general elections, in which Fernando Bilon Terry emerged victorious, who assumed command, recovering the presidency, on July 28 of that year, which marked the return of democracy. And the end of this period. At the end of the military government, the growing problems with the payment of the external debt and the inefficiency of the state administration led to the appearance of symptoms of economic crisis and incubated social problems that would increase in subsequent years. The second government of Fernando Bilond. He governed between 1980 and 1985. As soon as he took power, he signed the restitution of the newspapers to their former owners, with all of this the validity of freedom of expression was once again established in Peru. The municipal elections of 1980 were held. In that election, the ruling Popular Action Party dominated the elections with 90% of the municipalities. Between January 28 and February 2, 1981, the conflict with Ecuador occurred in the Condor Mountain Range, called Falso Paquisha. The main cause of the conflict with Ecuador, this country invaded Peruvian territory in the Cordillera del Condor, Amazonas, and named them after Ecuadorian places, Falso Paquisha. Peruvian troops under the command of Rafael Hoyos Rubio evicted the invaders. The fight against the state of the terrorist actions of the Shining Path, whose leader would be the university professor Abimael Guzman Reynoso, becomes evident. The Tupac Amaro Revolutionary Movement, MRTA, also appears, led by Victor Pola Campos. On the external level, in 1982, the Falklands War occurred, which pitted Argentina against England. Eight journalists were murdered in Achuraje, Ayacucha, in 1983. For the first time a pope visited the country, John Paul II, he did so between April 1 and 5, 1985. In 1984, Alfonso Barantes won the municipal elections, thus becoming the first Marxist mayor in the history of Peru. The 1981 census is carried out. Main works. 1. The civil code was reformed. 2. The Court of Constitutional Guarantees was established in Arequipa. 3. To counteract excessive inflation, a new monetary unit is created, the INTI. 4. Several hydroelectric plants are located, Canon del Pato, Ancash, Machu Picchu, Cusco. 5. A promotion is given to the agroenergy projects of Majas, Kaira, Pura, Tenejans, and Shavamakic. 6. The construction of homes for more than 300,000 families in Lima, Arequipa and Pura is promoted, through Fanavi. 7. During his five-year period, nearly 23,000 school classrooms were built. 8. The Canto Grande and San Jorge prisons were built in Lima. 9. The public ministry came into operation.